Um, no, this is not where we're going to settle for the long run. Uh, but I do think we're still we're still in a bit of a consolidation following that huge move that we saw. What we just saw from August of last year through February of this year, we're going to see that again once or twice, maybe three times. Uh, Treva Klingbeil from Trade Tech basically saying that she was asked uh, in a recent interview, okay, we've just seen the price double, now it's consolidating, what comes next? And her answer was repeat. Even in the last few months, we think we're gonna see some higher volume, very large moves to the upside in the equities when the commodity finally does go. If uranium was $500 a pound tomorrow, it would not speed up any of these projects. It just wouldn't. All right, how's it going, everybody? Um, again, as I said maybe earlier on in the week, uh, a couple of days ago, actually, this is somewhat of a new report here. The main idea is um, to have a, a news overview of the sort of a, 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 an overview of the week, the news from the week per Metals Group, if you will. So uh, I did a gold, silver, copper report earlier this week, call it an old world talks, if you will. And I'm doing an energy and battery metals report today, call it a, a new world talks, if you will. And uh, well, again, the name of the, the show is still up for debate. So let me know if, if, if I should change it and what it should be changed to. But as I've said before, I'm just kind of getting a little bit tired, annoyed, if you will, with the uh, oversupply in the podcasting market, where it's just it's just copy pasta all over the place and, and everyone gets the same people to ask them the same questions, the same thumbnails, the same, everything is just the same. And so they promote the same product. And it's I don't know. Um, I'm trying to come up with something uh, different, add some value if, if if and where possible. And so, yeah, an overview of the uranium overview this week specifically. That's going to be with Justin Hewn, the uranium insider. He's going to talk through a couple of interesting happenings uh, this week and, and potentially also price action. And then there's also three uranium companies being interviewed. One of them is a uranium lithium company, actually. So. Anyways, not much time to lose here. And Justin, it's been a while since you and I spoke. Um, always happy to chat to you. So thank you for being here, obviously. There are a bunch of things happening, though, in, in the energy space as a whole, as always. But there's, there's also a lot happening with uranium. Let's maybe first talk about... Um, no, let's actually start with the price action here, maybe. Because it seems that seems like the spot price is settling around this, uh, call it $90 level. So this is a decent 15 to 20% drop from, from the highs. Not a low price at all. Most projects make money at this level. Um, there are a bunch of projects that are just ramping up. So there is a little bit of a supply response there. Um, what are you What are you saying? Is, is, is this where we settle over the long run? Or do, I mean, are we going to have more spikes? Is this where we settle over the long run? Just price action talks. Um, no, this is not where we're going to settle for the long run. Uh, but I do think we're still we're still in a bit of a consolidation following that huge move that we saw. Um, obviously, it's taken some time for the industry, both the nuclear industry, nuclear utilities, fuel buyers, to consolidate that move and digest that move. It was such a large move, not only historically for uranium, but kind of for any commodity to double in price in four to five month period of time is a very, very large move. So the industry is consolidating that move right now. Um, what we're seeing now compared to, let's say, about three to four weeks ago is we're seeing volume start to trade a little bit a little bit more in the spot market. Um, it's coming back to life. As soon as the, the price hit and peaked out at that 106.50 a pound or whatever it was in the first or second week of February, following that, it was absolutely dead quiet in the spot market. Nobody wanted to touch it, especially the utilities. Um, we don't want to chase the price here. We don't want to necessarily be involved in um, in the movement of that price and contributing to the price rising even further. So it's such a large move that everybody stepped back and say, okay, that escalated quickly. Let's see where it settles out. So we saw the price, we saw the price fall from 106 to right around 100 bucks a pound and stay there for a minute. Uh, most of the folks that we spoke to in the industry felt like they'd be surprised if they saw it drop a whole a, a lot further from that. But the market was so quiet that a couple of traders offering very, very small amounts of uranium, very small volumes, moved the price all the way down to 80, 84 bucks a pound. So draw from 100 to 84, like pretty quickly on very, very low volume. Now, the good thing is that in a move from the low 50s to over 100, we're seeing buying interest come back in the 80s. So what that essentially means is 
everybody that's involved in participating in the spot market, buying and or selling, believes that the bottom is in, right? So that that's a very, very important psychological signal, let's say, for uh, for market participants to be purchasing, trading the commodity again in the high 80s, pushing $90 a pound here is an incredibly, incredibly positive sign when just a few short months ago, we were at 50 bucks a pound. So that's that's really the big takeaway. It's not that, oh, uranium price is never allowed to, to fall ever. That's not, that's not how this works. We're going to see over the course of the length of, the, of this investment, however long it lasts, we're going to see big moves to the upside, uh, some pulling back, some consolidating and rinse and repeat. I think this, what we just saw from August of last year through February of this year, we're going to see that again once or twice, maybe three times going forward in this market where we see big moves forward. Some kind of catalyst is going to move that. Uh, what moved the, la the price in the last run really was a couple of very large RFPs in the market were setting up to that price move. That One of them was PG&E's RFP for the extension of Diablo Canyon in California. A couple months later, the South Koreans came in with a much larger RFP with specific pricing requests or requirements in that RFP, and they did not get filled on that. And that was kind of a signal. Then the once the price started to move, risk kind of came on into the financial markets. That's always a signal for traders to start buying. Um, we saw a lot of producer buying going back into August, September, October. We actually saw Cameco buying and potentially the Kazakhs buying. Uh, the Russians were buying, the Chinese were buying. This was all in the spot market. And and then, of course, you have traders uh, and and, uh, uh, and nuclear utilities participating in that as well in smaller volumes. But basically, it was a big move up on relatively low volumes, consolidating and pulling back on low volumes. The volumes are just diminishing in the spot market pretty much across the board. That's going to lead to more volatility, not less. And until we see more liquidity being traded in the spot market, maybe that will happen in the coming year or two with, you know, the gears sort of grinding on supply responding. Maybe we'll see a little bit more material traded in the spot market. But from what we can tell, the spot market is firming up. It's starting to move back up slowly. It's still very quiet, but volumes are picking up a little bit. While at the same time, everything was quiet following that move. Spot market, term market. Everything was quiet. February. Term market is significantly heated up in the last four weeks. Um, so that's that's probably more of an important signal for the ongoing health of this market. The term prices haven't uh, pulled back. In fact, we are dead flat in the spot price year to date, which is kind of strange because it feels like so much bullish things have, have uh, come to pass already this year. But we're flat. Spot price is flat year to date. Equities are up. Term price is up. The term price is up 15% year to date. And the term market is uh, is definitely heating up. I think we have 26 million pounds officially inked as reported by UXC as of a few days ago. In the long-term market year to date, that's still significantly slower than last year, but the speed is accelerating a little bit here. A lot of conversations, a lot of RFPs, um, a lot of tenders in the market. And we expect that to continue going forward. So long story short, I think we're... We're slowly coming out of that consolidation period following the big move up, mm -hmm. not only for the physical market, but for equities as well. Long story short, not bearish, um, which is hard to believe given that you're not wearing your Dusty Rose shirt. Uh, I thought we had a deal that you wear that shirt with me. But um, OK, anyways, what, what Lobo Tigrit told me three, or maybe even four years ago is what he, when I spoke to him about uranium, he said th this these moves in the spot price are going to be two steps forward, one step back. He's just been completely right on that. And that's kind of first time I hear it, it sort of made me calm about it. When I see a pullback like this and I see it sort of settling down, I mean, it's not it's not a falling knife because it really it, it it really stamps a floor in, if you will, uh, over multiple trading sessions. And I'm like, OK, so this was the one step back ready for the two steps forward. It's just been true so far, more or less. It's not a perfect thing, of course, but yeah, that's kind of what's been happening. 100%. In the spot market. Yeah. yeah, higher highs, higher lows. That's yeah. what we're going to see in the bull market for this for this commodity, and mm -hmm. it's you can almost look at it in a similar kind of in a similar psychology as being a a stock speculator, uh, investor, trader, whatever it might be. When you see a stock have a big move up, it almost always consolidates and pull back, pulls back. 
And it's it's always very curious to see where the where are the buyers going to step in following that big move up, right? When a stock doubles on some good drill news, for example, it always pulls back. How far is it going to pull back before uh, speculators step in and think, okay, it's now cheap enough following that move? That's sort of what just happened, especially considering the, the low volumes. And you have to understand most of the industry in terms of the nuclear utilities, they have a little bit of inventory buffer always. So very rarely will you see a moment in the market where there is absolute panic buying by the utilities. They, they're going to try to avoid that situation as much as possible. And that's not something we're necessarily betting on. Could we see some kind of catalyst come in that will trigger that type of that type of behavior possibly, but it's not it's not the fundamental driver of the long-term price environment that is going to be rising for the commodity and for our investment thesis, right? But when the volumes are low in the spot market and you have a big move up, then it pulls back, you pull, continues to pull back. Finally, okay, so trader threw in a 100,000 pound offer. It was $90 a pound. They dropped it $6 a pound in a single day on 100,000 pounds which is pretty much almost the smallest amount of material you could buy in the spot market, 100,000 pounds at a time. That's how thin it was. And of course, somebody took that offer and, and it traded at 84, 85 and moved up from there. So the psychology is, is relatively clear here. The price is going to remain aloft. And then of course you have the assistance of the nuclear fuel analysts and price reporters like UXC and Trade Tech, essentially telling the industry you guys don't expect the price to keep falling. It's not going to. <laughs> in 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 the I've never seen this before, but Jonathan Hinsey from UXC, um, he basically publicly stated in an interview, I can't remember, I think it was in a Bloomberg article, saying, We think the bottom is in. Like he's calling the spot market bottom. Like this is not something that UXC has ever done. But you have the price reporters saying, We get it. We understand the structural nature of the physical market. We understand how it's problematic, at least for the near to midterm. Don't expect the price to fall. And the utilities listen to that. So um, one last note on that. We spoke with uh, Mr. John Chapaglia, and he's the CEO of Sprott. Sprott manages, of course, the Physically Uranium Trust and URNM, URNJ, ETFs. And he had quoted in, in our recent interview of him with our members webinar just a few days ago, he quoted uh, Treva Klingbeil from Trade Tech, basically saying that she was asked um, in a recent interview okay, we've just seen the price double. Now it's consolidating. What comes next? And her answer was repeat. Now, this is a person that has been over the target possibly more than anyone in the last five plus years. Trade Tech has definitely been more accurate in their forward-looking analysis and forecasting for the pricing environment for this market and much more realistic in terms of uh, supply response and the pricing environment that would be uh, that would be according to that supply response. So to hear her say, repeat, to hear uh, Hinzi call the bottom, interesting, interesting for these uh, nuclear fuel analyst price reporters that their their primary clientele is utilities. It's not you and I, it's utilities. And this is what they're telling them. Don't expect prices to fall. Um, we're going higher. Mm. I, I, I just think maybe they got too much flack on, on – um... On, on the Twitter sphere from people saying, oh, they're not bullish enough. And maybe they're bringing some of their clients in jeopardy, if you will, um, because they're the utilities. And maybe that makes the utilities less hedged because nobody thought the prices would go this high. And they're kind of changing the song here a little bit, uh, which obviously I don't mind. But then I'm also glad you brought up the term market um, because rumor has it, I suppose, or the expectation has it that we'll hit replacement rate contracting for a second year in a row here uh, in 2024. Uh, depending on whether you want to count 2023 as a, a replacement year contracting, uh, a replacement rate contracting year. But the price is up, as you said, on the term market is, is kind of settling. It's a, it's nothing jaw-dropping, right? There's no spike or anything like that. But it seems like deals are getting done at reasonable prices. Are you happy with the state of the contracting market? Had you expected more? How do you look at it? Um, I am happy with it. I would, I would just follow up really quickly with your commentary on UXC and, uh, you know, and, and the utilities. So the utilities, generally speaking, don't really hedge. You know, they they pretty much buy uranium when they need to buy uranium at whatever price uranium is priced at. There's not a lot of strategy around it, which is kind of surprising and very difficult for the investor mind to kind of understand. But um, they buy what they need to buy. It's whatever the price is that's out of their control and they buy when they need to buy. 
and UXC in their defense, you know, they do put out a great product and they, their primary responsibility, let's say, is to communicate to the nuclear industry what's going on in the physical market for uranium or conversion for enrichment, et cetera, not necessarily to predict the future. So um, in which they, they do a great job at that. But yes, their forecasting has been very, very conservative and in some cases utterly incorrect over the years. So they have they have gotten a lot of criticism from the investing side of things, but to my understanding, they're still very valuable to the nuclear industry as far as what they're what they're producing. Um but going going to your question on the term market, I am pleased with what I'm seeing. Um I think that it's possible that we see the replacement rate contracting volumes, let's say, which is essentially the predicted annual burn rate of the nuclear reactors in any given year and the level of contracting where it is relative to that. And that goes in cycles as well, right? So you go multiple years of an oversupplied market contracting and the term market is substantially less than the annual burn rate because utilities had been able to bolster inventories via the spot market um, and shorter term carry trades. And that's what they did in, in the 2010s, right? With the price collapsing volumes in the trade in the term market collapsing. But prior to that in the previous run, heavy volumes in the term market, a lot of that was driven by the Chinese, um, which was a big driver last year as well. And I think that this could actually be ever so slightly delayed in that we see 180 something million pounds consumed in the burn up rate of reactors operating this year. Are we gonna see 180 million pounds? Maybe, maybe not. Um, where we're at now, the reasoning why I think we could see that slightly delayed is because utilities have pulled forward and flexed up on their legacy contracts so much in the last 12 to 18 months, so significantly that that might, at least in the near term, delay certain utilities' needs to come into the term market. Um, but with all of that said, the contracts that are being signed now are going further out into the future they're higher volumes, they're lacking in flex provisions, they're referenced to the market rather than fixed price. So everything is showing that we are still fully in a term market contracting cycle 100%. Whether or not we'll see quote unquote replacement rate volumes being traded, being purchased in the long-term contracting market on an annual basis every year during this bull market, that's hard to say. We do know that the uncovered needs are significant, especially going out to, let's say, 2035, which is absolutely relevant because these long-term contracts are out going out to that period and beyond. We're seeing we're seeing an RFP right now in the market coming from the Slovaks. This goes out to 2039 for up to 21 million pounds. So this is, this is the way that certain utilities are thinking, um, recognizing now that we have a long-term structurally undersupplied market and they're going to want to secure those needs. So... With all of that said, if you are a new nuclear utility and you've got term market pricing officially 80 bucks a pound, but we're seeing market reference prices with floors around that area, which is why that is printed at that price, with ceilings 120, 130, right? And that's that's very high pricing. If you are a utility with those pricing elements in the market right now, but you were able to flex up on your deliveries this year or next year based on a legacy contract and get... 20% more material than you need, maybe that buys you a little time. That's all I'm saying. So um, if we don't see 180 million pounds signed in the term contracting market, I think it's it's not irrelevant, but it's not absolutely necessary to dictate the health of the term market and the continued trajectory of the price. Mm. It's kind of funny when you mentioned that uh, it's, it's hard for investors to understand that utilities are price insensitive buyers and no strategy, but I think it's easier for people who are married because it's kind of like my wife when it comes on to clothes, she's price insensitive, then no strategy at all, just buy. It's pretty much the strategy. But what do you, did you, so you, you're happy with the market. You kind of expected this maybe to happen with the term market. Did you expect the, the equities to behave like they have right now though? Oh, I would say, would I expect that the equities would have been far higher at $90 uranium? Yes, absolutely, I would have. Absolutely, I would have. Part of the reasoning for that, the denominator has changed during the period of time that the commodity uh, basically went sideways-ish while the equities consolidated. You know, let's say Q3, Q4 of 2021 till the middle of last year was quite the consolidation for equities. And the price of uranium didn't do a whole lot during that period of time. 
during that period of time, most of these companies had to stay alive, financially speaking, and had to issue shares to raise cash. So if you're if you actually chart the market capitalization of the companies, you'll see that almost all of these things are at multi-year, if not all-time highs. But the denominator changed. And that's, you know, the death by a thousand cuts in the junior mining industry is this dilution. So would we have would am I surprised daily to see URA knocking on the door of $30 here? Oh my God, yes. It's I cannot believe these things aren't significantly higher. But there's market forces at play that are out of my control that at the time, going back a couple of years, very hard to predict, right? Uh, I mean, the the rate hiking cycle, the risk off sentiment that per pervaded much of last year and kind of the later part of 22, um, all of these things, concerns about broad market crashing uh, up until just the recent three, four months, that was kind of at a, at a fever pitch. And uh, it's all of these things affect psychology. There's historic levels of cash sitting on the sidelines right now. All of these things affect not only investor psychology, but also, of course, funds flows into various sectors, including the sector that we cover. So hard to, hard to really say um, exactly why that happened. That's my take. But uh, either way, we think we think things are heading higher. We can we can perform in line with the commodity. You chart, let's say, URNM against the spot price of uranium. That can go directly horizontal for the next two, three, four years. And we're going to be very happy as the commodity is going to keep moving. Hmm. It's kind of funny uh, that this is not this is not only uranium. It's not, it's not funny actually, uh, but it's not only uranium. I I, I do uh, a precious metals and copper report early on in the week. At least I'm trying to now. And then um, in it we there's also something we discussed in it because since 1994, um, funnily before I was born, the gold price has gone up uh, like nine times since then. No, it's gone up five times since then, and the equities are not following and people are saying, why are they not following? It's because the number of the shares outstanding of the four biggest miners have gone up nine times. So the denominator changes and that happens everywhere. So this is why dilution should be watched very, very, very closely with these equities. This is just proof um, the euros are coming up with here. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not unique to uranium. It's the mining sector in general, you're seeing across the board miners underperforming the commodity, even when the commodity is in a bull market. Generally speaking, historically speaking, usually they play catch up in the later stages of those bull markets. And hopefully that's what we'll see here. Hmm. Yeah, hopefully. Um, hopefully they don't have to dilute as much, but I'm kind of losing that hope at, 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 at right now. But anyways, that's another long story. Let's maybe talk about some of the... Uh, more topical happenings um, this week. Some of the news, if you will. Apparently, there's another investment fund that's being launched uh, that will focus on uranium. This time, it's coming out of Luxembourg. Uh, I think it's called Tri Triton or whatever you call it. They, they, they say that they won't only do physical uranium. They will be... Um, I mean, they say this is sort of the easy part for them, I suppose, is what they call it. But they will be buying miners and enrichment facilities, uh, shares or investments in them and, and so on and so forth. Did you did you see that already? Yes, I did. Yeah, that was actually one of the things that was reported earlier this week by UXC. We do subscribe to their weekly product and they interviewed mm -hmm. Patrick Franz, which is the director of this vehicle. And um, yeah, it's, it's basically... Um, a collaboration with PFYN or PIFIN, which is established in Singapore a number of years back. And this was a vehicle that was presumed by the market to be another uranium, physical uranium fund. That didn't really come to pass, but I believe it is up and running. Now, along with uh, Trident Investments, which is which is based in Luxembourg, they are, like you said, they're going to be uh, having investment opportunities across the fuel cycle and potentially eventually with uh, actual nuclear reactor builders, small modular reactor builders. So um, it looks like an interesting vehicle. There's not a lot of transparency at this point yet. It's not aimed towards retail. It's it's being marketed towards um, institutional money, uh, family offices, uh, small funds, things like that. So um, we don't know how much they've raised. We don't know how much capital is interested in this vehicle, uh, but it is yet another thing, another another vehicle that investors will be able to access to expose themselves to this sector, generally speaking. So we view it as a net positive, but like I said, there's not a lot of transparency uh, in terms of what they've raised and how much how much uranium purchased or anything like that compared to a vehicle like Sprott, which gives you daily updates. Mm. 
uh, I'm kind of just waiting for the vehicle that solves the bottleneck that is the size of the space itself for the institutional for, for the institutional money that you that you mentioned that there might be money out there looking for a new home uranium theoretically and fundamentally can be that home but then technically it cannot because there's a I mean the space is just too small right and so I'm I'm I'm, I'm thinking if there's ever going to be a fund that kind of solves that do you think this one might be it I'm not sure. Um, probably not, but maybe. I think, you know, the the whole theory of size begetting size seems to be the case. We can see that in the outperformance of the mid and large caps, especially the large caps which, within this particular sector. Um, we've spoken, we speak frequently with, uh, with the specialty funds that are focused on this sector. And like I mentioned, we just spoke with uh, John Chapagli a few days back for our, our members webinar. And and they communicate with a lot of generalist institutions, right? These are larger funds that that invest broadly. They don't specialize necessarily in anything and interested in anything that will go up, right? So when they speak with these entities, if they want to go long the sector, they pull up their Bloomberg, they look at the top five most liquid stocks, and that's what they buy. Hmm. So they buy Sprott, they buy UVC, they buy uh, URNM or URNJ, they buy NextGen, they buy Cameco. And they're done. They're not doing a forward cash flow analysis. They're not. They're not doing anything other than liquidity. Liquidity. If they if they are convicted on the story, they believe it's going to go up. They've done their due diligence on the broad theme. They buy what's liquid. Period. The end. And liquidity is improving. So um, we're also seeing. I mean, just anecdotal evidence of this over the last month. What have we seen? We've seen Goldman Sachs issue coverage on the uranium sector. And Cameco specifically. We just saw Credit Suisse is now covering, right? So the thematic is it's broadening out here. This is no longer an orphaned asset, an orphaned sector that has a bunch of little retail guys just uh, uh, chatting about which, you know, a small cap penny stock to buy. We're, we're seeing major institutions covering this. Right before we got on this call, I was telling you that my partner sent me a clip from uh, CNBC that literally just aired, you know, 20 minutes ago where they were interviewing somebody from Terra Power and discussing the incredible electricity demand from data centers and AI and how small modular reactors could play a part. Like this is a big story and it's getting bigger. Um, Bank of America updated their coverage. They've been covering this for a little while now. They're saying the supply is not going to be balanced until 2029. They're raising their price targets for the commodity and all the, all the equities they cover. Canaccord, same thing. Deficit not, not fixed until 2028. So we have bigger institutional names like Credit Suisse, like Goldman that are covering the sector now. That's going to broaden out this story. And what I'm sort of seeing and kind of sensing right now is the commodity and the equities are, are consolidating here. They're moving sideways. We're seeing a lot of share issuance coming from URA, which means there's that's seeing inflows being matched off with some selling as well, but that's part of the consolidation process. We think we're seeing accumulation here. And when we see the next move up in the commodity, the story has broadened out so much, even in the last few months, we think we're going to see some higher volume, very large moves to the upside in the equities when the commodity finally does go. Because you're going to have a certain aspect, a certain portion, let's say, of investors that are following the story that are, that are or were long, that don't really get the core thesis that are momentum traders. They don't understand the supply deficit. They haven't modeled it out. And the price went from 106 to 84 and they're, oh, okay, this is over, I'm done, I'm out. It's not gonna happen again. You still have some of that sentiment. Of course, there's been plenty of rug pulls in the last five years in this sector. Uh, certainly plenty of rug pulls. I wouldn't call what just happened a rug pull. And, there's, and the evidence of that is that the equities are outperforming the flat spot price. Even though we went up and came back down, the equities are still uh, on balance up for the year, which is a very positive sign. So we think that some of the that momentum, hot money that is always in and out of this sector, when the commodity comes back up to that level and breaches it, it's going to be yet another piece of evidence to anybody watching this, that this thing is actually for real. And the fact that it's, the story is broadening out, being covered by bigger names, should lead to some larger, uh, higher net worth investors and funds 
um, coming into the story. And I think we just need the next piece of evidence that the commodity isn't done here. It's going to keep going. Once that happens, I think it's it's game on for the next leg. But they still come into these bigger names where it almost doesn't matter to them. Like it's pretty much the only option for them is Cameco, or they want a little bit more risk. They do next gen, but still like the huge name, which is kind of me. I mean, that even makes me question the belief that I've always had is that stock picking is, is I, I approach everything bottom up, right? I start at the asset level. I start with the geology, but then this makes me question that belief specifically when it comes down to uranium, because if there's money coming in, is it ever going to find its way to the smaller names? Um, and will stock picking even matter here, which I guess is important to you too, because that's essentially the uh, part of the service that you're selling is is better understanding these uh, sometimes smaller companies, sometimes more obscure companies. So what do you think about that? Sure. Um, stock picking does matter. Our focus list is up about 450% since August of 2019 compared to URA, which is up about 240%, including dividends. So just buying the ETF has underperformed, let's say, strategic investment in individual companies. So it can outperform the ETFs and the large caps. Um, the rotation of money is always theoretical to see whether or not we'll see rotation out of some of the larger cap stocks and into some of the small and mid cap stocks. But the ETF flows really, really affect this sector. And they really affect the mid caps or larger small caps that are large enough to be held by the ETFs and and have low float, so large institutional insider ownership, those stocks can really move violently on ETF flows. And we've seen multiple pieces of evidence of that over the last five plus years in this market. So will the small and mid caps outperform the large caps going forward? I don't know. Nobody really knows. Um, have they in previous bull markets? Yes. Um, usually that happens again towards the second half, let's say, of the overall bull market. Are we in the second half? I don't know. Like I've been saying, I've been saying we're early for so many years. And I continue to think that we might still be kind of early. Just the fact that this is broadening out and the thesis has changed. It's not just betting on the commodity coming back to the to the relative price of production. It's it's a demand story now. It's a demand story as much as it is a supply constrained story. That was kind of the focus of our newsletter this month in April was uh, this has gone from a supply can't respond fast enough and the price is going to come up to that whatever XYZ level. And now it's demand is growing so significantly that this might not only add to the length of this investment, but it might also add to the upside potential for the commodity itself. Mm -hmm. So all of that is to say, stock picking matters. You have to do your homework, of course. Um, just buying the large caps and the liquid uh, ETFs and large caps has done well for certain of those large caps. Some of those have outperformed the others pretty substantially. But um, buying the ETFs is a shotgun approach. It does work. If you can buy what, is work what has worked best for us has been investing in companies where we felt not only did the asset have potential of actually getting into production, but also that management would continue to act strategically and intelligently during the bull market process, not necessarily just, let's say, line their own pockets with bad deals or uh, just sit on an asset and wait for the wait for the rising tide to lift all boats. And that's 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 a strategy to half the companies in this space. Buy up something that has some uranium in it, which everything has uranium in it, actually. Um, but buy up a uranium asset, sit on it, stay alive via various forms of dilution over the years. And when the commodity moves, flows will come in. Eventually, they get large enough to get added to an ETF, and those ETF flows will move everything. And that's literally, that's the strategy of a lot of companies in this space. And that's not a strategy that we're interested in. Mm. So... Um, the, the management is more important than anything, period. I, In my opinion, it's more important than the asset. Um, with few exceptions, if the asset is unbelievable, unbelievably phenomenal, and there are a couple of those in this space, then the management can be a little bit more fast and loose with finances and things like that. And the company can still progress and the stock can still do extremely well. Um, I'm not going to name anybody here. But 
you really, really, if you're not going to just buy the ETFs, you got to do your homework. You have to understand stand the share structure. You have to speak with management. If management won't pick up the phone, I'm done. I'm mm. out. I don't care about the asset. I don't care about the share structure. I don't care about what uh, what index is holding that stock. All right. There, there's a large cap uranium stock. I'm not going to mention the name. It's held by a couple of unique indexes that only hold a few uranium uh, companies. We could not get management to talk to us, despite the fact that collectively our membership was a pretty large shareholder of the company. They wouldn't talk to us. They literally would not. They denied the the offer to get on a call with us and discuss the company's uh, plans going forward. They didn't want to talk to us. And we're not even that difficult of an interview, right? We don't grill people like like certain interviews, like really get into them, right? We just wanted to discuss, read the room, pick up the tea leaves. You can get so much from the tea leaves when you talk to management, more so than X, Y, Z is going to happen. This is our plan. But really kind of read between the lines is so unbelievably valuable. That's why it's so important to literally get on a phone, meet them in person, get on a Zoom call. If you can with management, it's it's crucial. So We've dumped two companies over the course of this newsletter because uh, they were unwilling to talk to us. Just it doesn't matter the stock performance. Um, that's just that's just a no go for us. So all of that is to say, buy the ETF, buy our newsletter, or do a hell of a lot of work on your own to make sure that that you're putting your money in the right places. Happened to me too, actually, and uh, keeps happening to me. Like at PDAC, for example, I I sort of. Um, I, I went booth to booth and I told people, uh, can we do an interview? I want to do an interview, look at what you brought with you, um, you know, gold, copper companies that brought core with them. Your new companies, not advisable to bring core with them. So that they didn't, but I, I couldn't get, uh, like either the CEO was not at the booth or the CEOs. Um, there was a bunch of CEOs who were like, okay, so what do you want to ask me? And I was like, well, well, you see, as we do the interview, I mean, that's kind of the point of the interviews for me to ask you some questions. They're like, oh, no way. I'm not going to do an interview if you don't tell me what you're going to ask me. Um, happens online too. Like I'd send, uh, you know, I see an interesting news release. I send a mail. They're like, uh, what would you want to talk about? And then I say like this news release and the company. Uh, and that's pretty much everything that I give them. They're like, okay, if you send us a list of questions, we'll get back to you in two weeks to let you know if that's fine. I mean, if, if management is not there to take the questions immediately, then then that is a good point. Um, that it that, that helps me weed out the bad ones too for me um, as I'm doing my job, I suppose here. So, what do you uh, what what is happening this week? Um, I made a note that we should talk about Kazakhstan, although I don't I don't know how much of an impact that might have, but be be good to get your thoughts on it. Um, Continue, Kazakhstan is continuing to suffer the floods. They seem to be getting worse. They are covering a, um, a significant part of the country, more than half of it. Any uranium implications so far? Not that we can tell. Um, we've, according to our contacts that are over there, doesn't seem to be affecting things for them. Um, it's possible that it could be affecting logistics, you know, the movement of people and material. That certainly could be impacted. Um, we don't think it's like a Cigar Lake flood type event. Uh, most of their most of their mining operations are in a completely different part of the country. It's a gigantic country geographically, so um, where the floods are happening is not where their mines are, basically. But the movement of people and materials could be affecting them. Um, no huge updates on Kazakhstan as of now. We continue to hear that the sulfuric acid market is kind of the primary driver of the of the implications for their production, near term, long term. They're working on uh, building that new sulfuric acid production facility. It's going to be 800,000 tons. They originally were saying it should take uh, two years to build and be online in 2026. The last one that was built took six years. Same company, uh, Italian companies building this one. The price is very high for sulfuric acid and the entities that are selling, producing and selling the material in country Two thirds of their production is basically slated for agriculture. And one third of that can be sold into the open market, usually to Kazadam Prom. Um, Uzbekistan is not exporting sulfuric acid. I know that Arano is uh, poking some holes in the ground there and trying to set that up. But from all, all signs that we can see, the planned ramp of production out of Uzbekistan was revised pretty significantly, pretty recently. They were expecting to double their production by 2030. Uh, they said this last year, and then they revised that down to maybe a 50% increase. Mm. So 
um, no real near-term production, uh, let's say windfalls happening there, but Arano is there. They're still having problems in Niger, potentially problems in Mongolia. So they're, they're trying to, they're trying to get their act together where they can. And Uzbekistan seems like a good place to do it, hmm. but they're not getting, they're not exporting sulfuric acid to Kazakhstan. So what Kazatomprom can't produce in house, they have to buy and they buy domestically and they import about half a million tons a year. That amount is also being implicated uh, by by various reasons coming from Russia. It's not it's being inhibited, I should say. So, no real relief in the near term in the sulfuric acid situation for Kazakhstan. We're, of course, going to be looking at each quarter reporting coming from the company. But we earlier last year when they said that they would be, it wasn't even earlier. It was in August. Uh, of last year. They said that they would be ramping their production this year. Of course, they've already re revised that down. That's old news. But they said they'd be hitting 30 and a half to 31 and a half thousand tons of uranium production in 2025, which is 80 million pounds. Um, we, they're, they aren't going to hit that. That's not a prediction. They're not even getting to come close. In fact, we don't think they meaningfully increased their production on a hundred percent basis out of Kazakhstan for years. We think the earliest that will happen probably is going to be 2027, possibly even later than that. And it most likely is going to be contingent on this new facility being up and running. So whenever that happens, unless there's a crash in the price of sulfuric acid or things just completely clear up in that area of the world in terms of Russia being able to export, freeing up rail cars and things like that, um, we think their production is not going to jump anywhere near what they have projected for many years going forward. Hmm. You actually made me think, and I looked it up as to how big is Kazakhstan? Like, how big is it? it it's actually a top 10 country. It's uh, the number ninth largest country. It's 40% larger than Mexico. Uh, and it's about the same size as Argentina. It's a, a humongous country, actually. It's huge. I knew yeah. it was big. I didn't know it was that big. Um, yeah. There it is. Well, you mentioned Uzbekistan, and you're making me think um, about Orano here, too, and where that connection is coming from. Is that the well, Iran is drilling aggressively in multiple places, but what reminded me of that, um, specifically now as we were talking about Kazakhstan, was Uzbekistan because that's where they will be quite aggressive over the next three years. I uh, saw it on Twitter, I believe uh, someone was talking about 200,000 meters of exploration is what they're going to be doing. W what do you make of their increased exploration efforts? They're drilling in this this year in Canada too with some of their joint ventures and so on and so forth. What are you making of all that? Um, well, Arano needs uranium. So they've, like I said, they've had, uh, they've been kind of sniffing around Mongolia. They've had a, a pilot processing plant that produced a, a tiny amount of uranium, but did, did actually prove out that they could do it in Mongolia. And that seemed like it was gaining some steam over the last few years, but it seems also like Russia kind of showed up on the scene. It was like, yeah, if uranium comes out of Mongolia, uh, we're going to be the first to do it. So I don't think that's going to be an easy jurisdiction for them to operate in going forward. Um, with Niger production being reduced because of the coup uh, last July that is still you know, in place, the military junta is still in control of the country. Uh, they have been unable to uh, produce. The, the mine has still been in operation, but they have had a hard time importing their reagents and a harder time exporting materials as well. So just a couple million pounds a year reduction out of Niger is affecting them. And they're needing to go elsewhere to make sure that they can shore up their uranium production because they still owe, I think it's 4 million pounds to Cameco. Um, they, they have long-term legacy contracts they have to fulfill. So they're in a little bit of a pinch. I would say out of the primary producers of the world, they're probably the most pinched on the supply side. So they're going to do what they need to do to to get more uranium out of the ground in various jurisdictions. Uzbekistan's kind of like Kazakhstan light, up and coming, slightly different geology, more acid per ton needed for the production there than in Kazakhstan. Um, but the potential is there. It's there. I think they'll get more. And of course, they're they're producing in Arano, uh, in Arano, in Saskatchewan as well. They're joint ventures with Cameco. They also have this Saber technology, which is a joint venture with Denison which is a borehole access. Uh, they, they drill down into the into the actual ore body and uh, use jet boring technology and then suck the slurry back up through the for the same device that drilled the hole. It's pretty brilliant. It's working. They've proven it out. 
and they're doing that at McLean Lake, and that's going to be producing half a million pounds a year on an annual basis going forward, uh, starting next year, I believe. So they're doing that there as well. Huge potential for Sabre in uh, the Athabasca and huge potential for more ISR projects going forward, especially if Denison gets Phoenix going. There's a lot of deposits there that could be viable for that technology. Of course, the first of a kind always takes some time and regulatory hurdles and things like that. But uh, Arano is doing what they can to get the production from wherever they can, basically. It, it'll make sense to me because within what we were previously talking about basically is, well, yeah, supply challenges. And it's been the topic for, for a while now, right? Um, and, and I know you almost have to go here. So that's basically a thought that I've been having that, that I wanted to ask you. But um, something that's not making much sense to me here is is why there's even a push for growing the demand side. Like, why is there even a push to grow the nuclear capacity? And I obviously I don't mean this from the perspective of energy security, because we obviously need more nuclear, and there shouldn't be two opinions about that. But mostly in the sense of the security of supply of uranium, right? If, if, if even I, literally a, a 20 something rando in a faraway country in a dark closeted room can understand that we are going to run up to uranium shortages and it could be a prolonged supply deficit surely the people that are giving the go ahead for the for building these multi billion dollar projects can see that too so that kind of makes me doubt my understanding of the nuclear world and it makes me think that they know something that I, I don't know so how do you think about that whole thing well, there there hasn't ever been a situation where a nuclear power plant has not been able to start up or has had to shut down because they couldn't get fuel. That hasn't happened. So there's no precedent for that. The industry understands that I'm sure that there's an enormous amount of uranium in the ground, in the oceans, in the phosphates, and just everywhere there's uranium. It's just a matter of the price remaining at an incentive level for a long enough period of time to projects come online. So I would say that despite the fact that we have a severe supply shortage this year, next year, the year following, really until Kazatomprom does ramp up significantly, assuming that they will, until we have Arrow and Phoenix and DASA, all of these larger projects, Namibian projects, all producing, and we have a quote-unquote balanced supply market. Until that happens, we've got the shortage, but there's inventories right? The utilities have inventories, certain sovereigns have inventories. And I think you also have to look at the economics of nuclear, even at $500 uranium, it's economic, right? You have a multi-billion dollar asset that oftentimes is extremely strategic. It's base load, it's clean. Increasingly, that's the focus, not necessarily the price paid for the commodity, because it's a small portion of the overall cost of producing electricity from a nuclear power plant. You have the sunk cost of building the facility, which is pretty large for nuclear. And then even the ongoing operational costs, uranium is still four, five, maybe 6% of the overall operating budget for a nuclear power plant. So the price can fluctuate hugely and it's not going to affect um, to a substantial degree the overall cost of that electricity. With all of that said, I don't think anybody is looking in the industry is looking here and saying, well, if we invest in this facility, we're not going to be able to fuel it. As even you know, you or I know, if the price goes to 150, 200, 250, it's it sticks there for five years. We're going to see supply respond, right? It's going to happen. It just takes time, and that's why this window that we have right now is so unique and so valuable. Eventually, we'll see a supply response to a pricing environment that is. 150 in north and it stays there for a while we're going we're going to see that supply respond but it takes time and we're in that period right now of it taking time so the projects that are hugely profitable at at signing contracts at market reference for the 130 dollar ceilings those guys are trying to produce more <laughs> and they're trying to get their projects up and off the ground um, the marginal projects still most of them are on the sidelines Gears are starting starting to turn. They're starting to move towards final investment decisions, uh, moving towards development. But even when that does kick into gear, you've got three, four, five years for most of these projects to produce that first uh, yellow cake in a can. So this is that unique opportunity right now where the pricing environment is relatively clear. The growth of the industry is relatively clear, but supply can't respond. It 
fast enough. If uranium was $500 a pound tomorrow, it would not speed up any of these projects. It just wouldn't. All right, sir. Well, I appreciate that overview, and I know they have to go here. You found uranium, what, in 2018? 2016 is when I first when it first came on my radar. I didn't start really um, the initial stages of investment until, twenty late, let's say, late 2017, 2018. Okay. What else is on your radar right now besides uranium? Um, well, I'm personally long precious metals through various means, a couple of miners, a couple of physical, uh, a little bit of physical, some options plays. Um, I think oil services is another interesting place. I, I also have some money on the line there. Copper is on my radar. I don't, I don't know that market as well. Um, I also missed a lot of the move that's already happened, but that's another one that looks probably like a good one for the long term. Um, so I'm looking at all of those. I do have money on the line in some of that. Um, You're not paying attention to tin? Not paying attention to tin, no. <laughs> no, but I know it has had a good run recently. And and the the few tin stocks that you can buy have, have done well as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's not really on my radar. Uh, honestly, that's it's pretty all-consuming to do what we do. We're we're so focused on this, especially with with everything that's happened in the last even 12 months, it's, 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 it's truly unbelievable. Um, we think, we think this has very wide reaching long-term implications in terms, especially the growth of AI and data centers. I, this is real. This is really actually happening. Um, the demand is growing. Countries that have the, the large U S the largest nuclear fleet has the most data centers. So all of these things that are operating now, most likely will be a life extended. We just saw Constellation report yesterday that they're they just applied to extend Dresden two and three to boiling water reactors that are relatively large in Illinois. Um, those are going to get life extensions twenty years, most likely. It's going to be approved because they have to. They these have to get when physic when physical reality like comes to bear, you don't have a lot of choice in the matter. And and that's I think the environment we're we're seeing here. So if some of these electricity demand projections even are halfway true, and we start to see rolling blackouts in first world Western countries, the government is going to throw enormous amounts of money at fixing the problem. And we think that's a tailwind for nuclear. All right. Well, thank you, Justin. I, um, As I'm fidgeting with my computer here, I still do appreciate you stopping by. Always fun to have. I uh, know you actually have to go now. Hopefully, you can get another update sometime next month or so. Um, I'll let you drop off now, though, as I'll be moving on to the CEO barbecue segment of today's episode. But as always, first of all, fair disclaimer and an honest confession here at Resource Talks, we don't hate you. So you should know that I have no idea what I'm doing. I have never made any serious money in this space and so haven't most of the talking heads, to be fair. And I should not be considered any type of authority here. And so shouldn't most of the talking heads out there. I don't have a track record for you to, to tell you what to do uh, with your money or to tell you what I'm doing with my money. So you should be aware of that. And in addition, I should be considered biased here. Because Sky Harbor is a paying client of Resource Talks, and this video in particular is part of their marketing campaign. So although at least a couple of minutes of research might have gone into this, and although I never share the questions up front, nor do I give the company's editing rights, which is one of the reasons why um, you don't see every company on here. Um, you do see a lot of companies in other places. Anyways, you should still be skeptical of everything you hear in here and um, consider everyone biased. These are all going to be general and impersonal private conversations between two individuals on the internet. So it only makes sense for you to approach this with caution. If you don't enjoy losing money, please head over to setterplus.ca where you find the company's official filings. Uh, I want you to read them, bake them, take them on vacation and read them again. And then talk to a professional investment advisor before taking your own decision in the end because the mineral exploration, development and mining industry is a very risky space to deploy capital in, and were you to decide to do that, eventually you should do so cautiously. Obviously, there's also going to be forward-looking statements being made in this uh, conversation, so please read what's on your screen right now while I'm kicking it off with, um, as I said, a uranium company that you've seen on a barbecue quite often, and I am indeed talking about Sky Harbor Resources, listed as SYH on the Ventures Exchange in Canada. But, uh, no need for a fancy introduction here again. Then a couple of times, Sky Harbor is though an, an Athabasca based and focused uranium exploration and project generated company. So kind of a unique model here. 
they're currently drilling their own projects with the largest drill program uh, that, that they've ever done for a total of 8,000 meters. That'd be 5,000 meters of them planned for Russell Lake and 3,000 meters planned for Moore Lake this year. Um, as to the, the options projects, which are on, on the project generator side of the business, the partner projects, if you will, there's a lot going on here. And we're going to be talking uh, about that moving forward. Um, but they're, they're their partnerships with Valor, Azincourt, North Shore, Tisdale, Orano, and a couple of others. And um, pretty much all of them are doing, well, almost all of them are doing their drill programs as well this year. So a lot to talk about there. Overall, the option agreements as they stand at the time of recording of this video, by the way, are set to deliver um, over $33 million in partner-funded exploration, over $27 million of partners' shares being issued to Sky Harbor, and over $19 million in uh, cash payment, assuming the entire earning agreements get completed. And that's almost 80 million bucks. Again, something we'll talk about later on. Sounds like a lot, which is not surprising given that the company uh, sits on almost 600,000 hectares of land in the Athabasca Basin and has its fingers in no less than 29 projects, a number that, by the way, has been growing since uh, you and I last spoke, Jordan. And this might be a good point to pick it up actually because you again you just in, increased your land position by something over 10 percent, i believe so how come what what factors led to this decision well thank you antonio that was a a, a great initial intro i couldn't couldn't have done it better myself so a lot to go through but uh yeah we've been quite busy since we last spoke which wasn't too long ago but uh Part of the, the news flow has been additional project acquisitions, mostly through staking, although we have added bits and pieces through some uh, relatively inexpensive property deals with other companies. Uh, so the project portfolio, as you pointed out, uh, is uh, now 29, sits at 29 projects, uh, well over uh, 580,000 hectares. So, so one point, call it 1.4 plus million acres of ground in northern Saskatchewan puts us at the third as the third largest mineral tenure holder in the region. Um, you know, we've staked projects and acquired uh, projects throughout the basin. The idea here is to provide us and in, in, in our investors with exposure to not just one sub -re region of the basin. We have a lot of projects, for example, concentrated in the southeastern quadrant. That's where our two main projects are at Russell and more. We want to have exposure to pretty much every nook and cranny in the Athabasca Basin, not just within the sandstone cover, but outside of the sandstone cover as well. Uh, so we've got projects now in the portfolio uh, that do just that. Uh, they cover lots of different subregions, uh, the north end of the basin, the south uh, southwest, the south central part, and then the eastern flank of the Athabasca Basin, both inside the sandstone cover and outside the sandstone cover. It's important to uh, note that Previously, the Athabasca Basin and the sedimentary sandstone uh, that makes up the basin, it was a much larger geological formation previously, extending many, many kilometers uh, outside of the current margin. So there is great exploration upside potential, not just within the sandstone cover, when you see on the map that big oval shape on the map where the current sandstone cover is, but there's good exploration and uranium discovery potential outside of that sandstone cover uh, as well. We've seen uh, more recently uh, companies make major discoveries outside of the sandstone cover, notably Fission at PLS and a few others on the eastern flank. So uh, it, there, there's, uh, and, it, and it's less combed over as well. I think that's another important point. It hasn't been uh, thoroughly explored. Uh, it's kind of more recently where you've seen companies raise money and, and carry out exploration for projects uh, outside of that sandstone cover. So we've got Bottom line, we've got projects that cover uh, uh, that that kind of cover the entire basin, if you will, and and offer us and our investors exposure to uh, multiple regions within northern Saskatchewan. Hmm. You, you said you're the third largest landholder there. Do you, do you know who the other two? Are? I believe Cameco would be one of them. They have quite a lot. Yeah, Cameco and, and Atha, um, they're the I believe the largest uh, by by acreage. So you know it's it's uh, it's important obviously to have a a big footprint uh, as uh, in the Athabasca Basin, uh, as much as you can have, uh, but you do have to advance the projects. There are assessment credits that uh, are uh, and work that's required to keep the, the properties in good standing. And uh, we're fortunate that we have most of our um, more advanced stage exploration projects are, I, I'd say are more material projects in our project portfolio, have lots of assessment credit 
built up in them. So they're um, they're in good standing for many, many years. Russell and Moore Lake, for example, um, you know, have lots of historical work and in, in assessment credit banked up. So those projects, um, uh, uh, there, there's no uh, need to spend money on an annual basis from an assessment credit standpoint. And then we have uh, various partner companies, seven in total now, uh, three of which are joint ventures. Uh, four of those are still in the earn-in option phase of that partnership. Uh, and those companies are spending money at those projects uh, to uh, earn in. A part of those agreements, typically they do have to keep the claims in good standing as well. How much money will that be out of pocket for you cost per year to keep the entire portfolio if you take out the partner spending and if you take out the money that's already being spent and keeping the some of these projects in good standing for years to come, as you said? Yeah, it, so it, it's the way it works in Saskatchewan. It's $15 per hectare, right? So for every 100,000 hectares uh, per year. So for every 100,000 hectares, um, it's uh, $1.5 million, right, uh, that that needs to be spent. Uh, in our portfolio, I'd have to go through the, the numbers, but uh, as I said, most of the, well, all of the the more material projects in our portfolio um, are, are good right through the remainder pretty much of this decade into uh, 2030. There are claims that we've recently staked, as we just talked about, uh, that, that would require uh, you know, the $15 per hectare, you do get a, uh, a a period of a year when you initially stake where you don't have to spend any money. So you get this buffer year and uh, uh, most of the claims that we've staked recently are within that. So there's, there, there isn't the nece necessity for work this year. It starts next year. Um, so in total, um, you, to, to, to keep those claims in good standing again, this is, you know, this is not this year, but next year, uh, you know, it'd be, probably somewhere in that million and a half to $2 million uh, range in exploration. All right. Um, well covered by uh, by the options payments coming in, I assume. Yeah, no, no. And no, sorry. Yeah. And so the option payments from the seven partner companies, the four in particular right now that are still earning in, the, those are all, um, those projects, it's, it's a part of the act, it's part of the, the option agreement. They are obligated to keep those claims in good standing. So in most cases for those projects in our portfolio, those various projects, Preston with the Rano, East Preston with Azincourt, Man Lake with Basin Uranium, um, uh, the Falcon and South Falcon East projects, these projects have had uh, enough work on them uh, and are being actively advanced where, uh, you know, there is an uh, assessment credit due this year. It's they're, they're pushed out for a number of years. Yeah, I was mostly talking about the actual cash payment. So the nineteen million oh, bucks you expect coming in. How much? Yes. How much of that do you think is going to come in this year specifically? Yeah, we, we've we've been getting between a million and a half to two million dollars a year recently with these cash and share payments. I'd say that's probably a, a you know a, a good reasonable expectation this year. Now that those numbers do accelerate as the uh, earn-in options work uh, into the the later years of the earn-in, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously not including any new potential option partners. We are in advanced negotiations on a few of our other drill-ready projects that we we own 100 of to bring in new partner companies. But uh, I'd say that's a reasonable estimate. Now that it could be more um, if the market really heats up. I'd expect that number to ramp up to probably closer to three to four million. Um, it, you know, it really does uh, depend on, you know, the the company's ability to raise capital, which is obviously very dependent on market conditions. But I'd say all else equal right now, that would be a fair expectation, uh, conservative expectation. Right. Okay, fair enough. Um, Jordan, I'm wondering about this, the, the, the Wallenstein domain um, project here, as you mentioned, technically, Folds, falls outside of the Athabasca Basin sandstone. And and I appreciate you you targeting that head on there at the beginning. Um, what I'm wondering about is that, it, is this only really for the prospect generator model? Or is there maybe a strategic angle to some of this given its proximity to chemicals, rabbit lake operation and stuff like that? Like, are you actively looking for a partnership with some of those guys? Or is this just within your prospector model? Yeah, so we, we staked a, a, a number of, properties and claims um, in that region, kind of up towards the northeast, northeast of, uh, uh, and 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 even further east of um, Rabbit Lake McLean and a few of the other uh, notable projects in that region. Um, look, there's great geology there, as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, the 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 sandstone cover uh, as we know it today, it was uh, it was much further out uh, previously. So you still got you know the similar geology outside of the Athabasca uh, Basin cover. Uh, and and but but you're looking there. You're not obviously looking for sandstone hosted deposits. You're looking for basement hosted deposits. And the strategy there for us is, uh, you know, yes, it'll be a part of our prospect generator business. It's a, a big property package that we think we can garner interest from a new partner company. Um, you're, you know, as you just pointed out, um, you've got some other notable larger companies in the region that are active there. And so, um, are we planning to go and do? A lot of work there uh, in the next uh, couple of years, uh, not as of right now. Um, we ideally would find a partner company to come in and uh, advance those projects. And we're looking at a number of options. We are, as I mentioned, in talks with a few companies on potential option uh, agreements. And we're looking at more, in this case, kind of a, a little bit more unique and different from what we've done in the past where we've done one-off property deals. In this case, and a part of the reason we stake um, a number of different projects is to build a portfolio that can then go into a new company versus just a one one project uh, that they're optioning into. Oh, cool. that's interesting. That's something maybe you should expand on because it's again it's different from what you've done before. Would this like w w would you ideally want this to go into a, a new company that's getting an entry into the basin, or are you packaging it for someone special? How would that work? Yeah, I mean, I, well, it, 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 we're talking with a few groups and, and you know, likely someone new, um, but it could also be a company that's just looking for additional projects in the Athabasca. I think given that, um, you know, again, this strategy is a little bit different where we're, we're looking at more of a, it's more of a portfolio approach where it's not just, again, a one-off uh, project that we're optioning. It's, you know, here are several projects and you can come to market uh, as a new entrant with uh, several properties and a significant land package versus just a you know one-off property that um, you know might be might be might work out might not work out. So yeah, this is this is a bit of a new um, kind of strategy that we're looking at, and and I think uh, I think it'll be received well by the market. And we got to obviously get you know bring in a partner company first, but I, I think there's a lot of upside with this uh, kind of broader project portfolio approach versus just, you know, one project that they're going to go work. Hmm. You said you don't think you're going to do a whole lot of work on these projects. Um, do you think you, you have to do some work on them before you can actually go towards a transaction of this type or are they just transaction ready as they are? It, it, some, some of the properties are, are ready for, I mean, they, you know, they're all ready for exploration. Some claims are you know, I've had a little bit more work carried out on them historically uh, than others. Um, there, there are, you know, there that uh, part of the basin uh, or that that region within northern Saskatchewan, um, just outside of the sandstone cover, uh, to the north, northeast, and to the east is is you know they're they're earlier stage projects. Um, but um, like I said, geologically they're they're still very prospective. Um, they're on some major regional structural trends, uh, and uh, I, they haven't. Quite frankly, they just haven't been explored as much as kind of the more uh, notable regions within the Athabasca Basin. So, you know, there's there's every possibility that there are more high grade uranium deposits, basement hosted deposits at these projects. They just need the necessary exploration and work carried out on them. Hmm. When you say that there could be basement hosted deposits, is there where is that? coming from i mean is that, is that sort of a, a big big caveat could or is it based on knowing the structural controls or something else that you have um access to yeah no no look they've, they've got a lot of the same ingredients geological ingredients the structures the conductors <laughs> uh the alteration that you would see um at your kind of more typical uh in the basin project right they just don't have the sandstone cover and the unconformity um, and, uh, and so, and, and there's, there's also polymetallic potential at some of these projects too, which is interesting. And we, we have that at, uh, some of our, our, our other projects, albeit, you know, the, the focus for us at least is, is on the uranium needless to say, but, um, yeah, they're, they're look, they've got, you know, they've got ingredient, they've got the geological ingredients that you need, uh, to host, you know, to host uranium deposits without having been thoroughly explored. Um, and, you know, as you work your way 
much further outside of the basin cover. Obviously, you you know the the the, the prospectivity for high grade uranium, your traditional uh, basement hosted uh, uranium deposit that you know that does fade away as you get further away, but. Um, I think the you know the the misconception that there's no uranium outside of the sandstone cover, obviously that's not the case. Um, and um, I think there's going to be more discoveries made outside of the of of the sandstone cover. Hmm. Is drilling outside of the sandstone cover <laughs> easier or harder? Um, and, and I mean, and did you have any examples of of companies that that are doing it currently? Um, I, 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 so, you know, you're drilling, uh, typically it can be more competent rock, um, with the basement rock. Uh, it's, you know, when you're drilling through sandstone, it's, it can be challenging. Um, if you look at when you actually make a discovery and you, and you're drilling into, uh, or, or close to making a discovery and you're drilling into, uh, a lot of clay alteration and, and, uh, various other indicator minerals, um, as the drilling gets more difficult in that situation, it's actually a pretty good, indicator that you're you're on to something um and so yeah i mean look it just it it depends but you know typically um no you can you look the drilling uh it, it, a lot of it depends on depth too how deep are you going um and you know a lot of the basement hosted targets uh call it basement hosted targets but outside of the sandstone cover you know a lot of times you're drilling relatively shallow targets that you know you could go a little bit deeper but you may as well test the shallow stuff first um, and so, yeah, you know, the drilling, you know, doesn't make a huge difference. Um, it, it does depend on a, on a number of variables, but yet you, you do have the added complexity in the basin with the sandstone, which can, can be a little more challenging, um, to drill through. Mm. Well, but w where I'm coming from with this and, and why sort of the more geology specific questions is because, well, first of all, because I want to pretend like I know what I'm talking about and make people on YouTube think that I do, which I don't, but that's always nice. But I'm just wondering how you decide, like how, how do you decide what projects get drilled versus what projects you keep for the prospect generator model? Right. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, you know, we, we've, um, with a project portfolio of 29 properties, you know, that the, the selection process obviously becomes important. Now, uh, you know, a part of it is we just simply don't have the bandwidth um, to go and 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 explore all of these projects, uh, and nor nor do we want to take the dilution um, and the and the you know the the effect on the capital structure uh, at this point. Um, now that changes obviously with the market. Um, you know, with uh, cost of capital, if the market continues to uh, move higher and your cost of capital is lower, um, you know, we we may change this. Uh, strategy slightly, but right now, uh, you know, we, uh, as we've talked about, we've uh, basically identified the the uh, and selected our two main co-flagship projects, Russell and Moore Lake, as the two projects that we're going to be actively funding, aggressively exploring and funding um, with this 8,000 meter winter drill program that you uh, alluded to earlier. 5,000 meters of that at, at Russell currently and 3,000 meters at Moore this winter. So that's, uh, we're still drilling, but that, that'll be wrapping up here shortly. Assays pending, a lot of news flow coming out over the next few months on, on, on the drilling and on the results from uh, this program. A pivotal program for us at both projects, um, quite frankly, and uh, happy to talk a bit more about that. But uh, getting back to uh, the selection process. So Russell and Moore Lake, are uh, two advanced stage exploration projects strategically situated in the real kind of prime real estate heart of the southeastern part of the basin, south of the MacArthur River Mine and north of uh, northeast of the Key Lake Mill and adjacent to Denison's Wheeler River project. As you know, they're our largest uh, corporate and strategic shareholder and Dave, their president and CEO is a director of Sky Harbor. So we're actively drilling targets just a few kilometers away from Phoenix and from the property boundary with Wheeler. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but, you know, we, we, we uh, currently right now, uh, Russell and Moore uh, are the focus uh, with the 8,000 meters. And then we were fully funded for another eight to 10,000 meters, minimum eight to 10,000 meters this summer, take us right through next into the next year. We have uh, done a little bit of work at some of these other projects in our portfolio before we optioned uh, South Falcon East and Falcon, 
to Tisdale uh, and North Shore um, in the last year and a half here. We did do a, a fairly uh, extensive geophysical program at that project. Um, and now these two companies uh, have taken over uh, those claims and option those claims. And uh, so we, 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 we will, from time to time, um, put some money to work in some of these secondary um, projects. But uh, like we discussed earlier, uh, projects that we have identified or selected as the prospect generator projects, we typically want to try to find a partner company to come in and advance them. Right. Okay. Well, that's a fair overview. Uh, thank you. That was extensive too. Um, let's do indeed talk about what you've been, uh, about your own drilling, what you've been doing, how's, and how that's going. Are you coming in on budget? Last time we spoke, you told me that it's going to be sort of in the $300 a meter range. Are you coming in on budget so far? Yeah, no, it's, look, it's, it's been a, a, a incredible, uh, you know, start to the year. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're very excited with what we're seeing and, and, uh, very much looking forward to reporting on results from both Russell and Moore Lake. The drilling, um, I mean, this, I, you know, this is something I think that gets overlooked in the Athabasca Basin and in mining and, and exploration in general. But, um, you know, it's always very important, especially with recent cost inflation. It's very important to have, you know, good drillers, contractors. Um, you, you, you hear about the ge the geologists and the geological team, um, you know, all the time, but you don't really hear a lot about, you know, the, the drillers and and the other contractors that are actually you know, carrying out uh, this this mineral exploration and the the driller that we've been working with, um, Sear Drilling has done a fantastic job. Um, we're on budget. Um, production's very very good. So yeah, three hundred to uh, call it three hundred and thirty Canadian all in a meter. Russell, it's important to note, it's road accessible. The road that uh, the haulage road that goes to MacArthur River runs right up through the Western Claims, uh, and there's power there. There's the exploration camp. The targets at both Russell Lake and Moore Lake are relatively shallow, which is important. So uh, the drilling has gone uh, extremely well. Uh, and uh, at Russell Lake, as we discussed previously, this project is at kind of the earlier part uh, on the Lasan curve. We're out there looking to make a new major high-grade discovery, looking to be that next big discovery success in the basin. And uh, we're very confident we're going to do that this year couple of the targets, uh, one in particular that looks very, very promising. So uh, we're we're going to get the assays in and we'll have numbers out. And then we'll follow that right up uh, with a summer program, uh, which will commence uh, probably in June or July. Um, that's at Russell. And then at Moore Lake, a little bit of a different uh, approach to the drilling in that um, it's more resource expansion and infill drilling at the main uh, in East uh, Maverick zones, which are host to very high grade mineralization, relatively shallow. And so we're, we're looking to expand those known high grade zones there. Um, needless to say, with this three th initial 3000 meters, uh, which uh, we're, we're just wrapping up, um, we are expecting some good numbers from that as, um, as given that we're drilling uh, back to look to expand that known high grade zone. We did do a little bit of drilling regionally as well, uh, but most of that and at uh, 3000 meters and most of the upcoming summer program um, is going to be focused at that Maverick corridor. Okay, um, uh, uh, again, extensive. <clears throat> Are you coming in on, on on time and on budget? I mean, is everything basically going as, as you had planned? Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely it is. Okay. It's, it's uh, yeah, and, and you know, one of the other benefits to now having uh, I mean, Moore Lake, uh, as we've discussed, um, you know, which which has been the focus for us for the for the most part over the last handful of years. Um, uh, you know, that project uh, it's the most advanced stage project in our project portfolio. Uh, but the costs at Moore Lake drilling there now have come down because we because of Russell, where we've got the camp, we can stage out of there the winter roads that get us to the Maverick uh, corridor and to the. Uh, the the main Maverick zone and Maverick East zones, um, they they're winter roads that come right through Russell, um, and so it's it's actually the acquisition and option uh, to earn in at Russell has brought our drill costs down at both well at at Moore Lake and the drill costs at Russell, given most of the targets are road accessible, we have the camp are very 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 low relative to a lot of other projects, more remote projects in the basin. You said you liked what you're seeing. 
what are you seeing? Anything you can tell me about in terms of um, alteration, structural controls, and mineralogy, or something else that you can you can talk to me about? Well, I, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait for the numbers. There's mineralization. I mean, it, you know, as as, you, as I said with Moore Lake, it's you know we're we're going back into basically expand known zones of mineralization, and uh, you know, look at Russell Lake. Um, we we it was our first inaugural drill program uh, a year ago. And, uh, you know, we, we intersected mineralization in most holes, in particular, the grayling uh, target area. So we've continued drilling a number of targets in and around that broader grayling target area. And uh, without saying too much, yes, we're, we're very, very happy with, with what we're seeing. Um, some new ideas that we came into this program with are, are, are paying off. Okay. When did you say, you, you must have just said it, but I must have missed it. When, when do you want to have the assays out? Uh, it'll be within the next month to two months. I expect it obviously depending on, uh, on labs, we'll, you know, we'll batch them up right, uh, into, um, you know, uh, press releases, uh, probably you, you'll see news releases on the results from both Russell and more. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a busy couple months of, of news flow and that'll again, segue right into a summer program. Right. And, and the news release is also hand in hand, I suppose, with what your partners are doing. I just saw Orano has started drilling. Um, what what is it? Five of your seven partners, six of your seven partners, I believe, are doing programs this year, right? It, it's yeah. So right right now, um, we are expecting. So it, four of them currently are are active. Um, of the seven, um, we are expecting five, maybe six of them, um, this year to uh, have carried out either drilling or you know various other field programs, exploration programs. So. Just moving our way from the the west side to the east side, um, we have our JV partnership with Arano. Um, they've commenced a a, a, a multi phased field program this year, budget of just under nine hundred thousand dollars Canadian. That's the first program uh, that they've carried out at the project in in four years. So very excited for them to get back to work there. Mm -hmm. I think it says a lot about. The prospectivity of the project it's just south of uh, pls and and of next gen's aero deposit uh, it's road accessible as well um, and uh, they're initially carrying out some geophysics followed by uh, a real interesting uh, soil sampling uh, program uh, called an sgh program which will uh, be carried out this summer and uh, the, the the goal of the program is to um, garner uh, new and refine additional drill targets at the project so that's uh, that's ongoing. Uh, that'll go right through this summer. Um, we'll have some news flow on that. We are participating in that program uh, as a minority joint venture partner. Beside them, uh, Azincourt, uh, who's been one of our busiest, most active uh, option and JV partners. Um, they've just commenced a 1500 meter winter drill program, which we are participating in uh, as well. So very excited for them to um, uh, carry that program out. Um, I think they're well on their way to a new discovery there. And then uh, moving over to the eastern uh, side where most of our projects are uh, located, uh, we've got our newest JV partner, Valor Resources. We've just announced the formation of the JV with them, 8020. Um, and we are expecting some work from them at the at the Hook Lake project later this year. And then the of the four Earnin option partners, currently two. Uh, are drilling uh, or have just finished drill programs. So starting with North Shore at the Falcon project, they just completed a inaugural drill program uh, and uh, they've announced elevated radioactivity alteration, really good looking rock in the first few holes that they drilled at the Falcon project. Assays are pending on that. And uh, we are expecting uh, another program from them later this year as they earn in at the Falcon project. And then beside them, um, uh, Tisdale Clean Energy uh, is uh, in the middle of a multi-phased uh, uh, program, drill program. They completed the first phase. Assays are pending from that. They confirmed mineralization uh, at the South Falcon East project. Again, this project is host to a small uh, 7 million pound inferred resource right at surface, the Fraser Lakes Zone B deposit. So they're looking to go back in and, and uh, further delineate and expand uh, that deposit as well as test some some other targets regionally at the project. Uh, they have, they're on a break right now and they're going to be uh, commencing a second phase in this program here shortly. So um, not just the drilling that we're carrying out at Russell and more, 
You've got a handful of other programs uh, that are either underway, um, assays pending, uh, and future programs this year at uh, the handful of partner uh, programs and projects that we have. Mm. Is um, Valor Resources that an Aussie listed company? Uh, yeah, it is. Yes. So they've, uh, they're have they listed on the ASX under the symbol VAL, and uh, they, they made their final payment earlier this year. Uh, to complete the the earn-in at Hook Lake, and uh, we we are uh, expecting some additional work from them uh, later this year at that project. Right, and also just to be clear for the record, uh, for people listening, there's a discovery group company that goes by the name Valor. That's V O, and that's in Canada. Yeah, this different is Valor, di different, different company, different company. Yes, yes. Just F Y I. Um, what what are the Aussies doing in uh in the base and how they find you? Uh well that yeah that that was an option agreement we initially signed in late 2020 uh it closed in early 2021 um uh George Bach who runs it uh, I've gotten to know well uh executive based in in Perth mining executive based in Perth and he's done a great job uh building that company uh up and uh, we're we're a big big shareholder we're one of their largest shareholders is you know, with the prospect generator business, one of the, you know, several benefits uh, that that uh, that we get from it is, you know, having large equity stakes in these partner companies. So uh, if they're successful with the exploration, we benefit uh, and our shareholders benefit with exposure, not just to the uh, the project through typically a minority interest in in the project or or in some cases even an NSR, but we also typically retain, you know, a fairly large uh, shareholding in the company as well. Right. Okay. When it's all said and done, this work is done. Um, hopefully the payments have come in from all of your option partners. How much money are you going to be left with? How much money do you have right now in the bank and, and how much money are you going to be left with? Yeah, we've got well over 7 million. Um, so again, that's that fully funds all of the, the, the uh, drilling and exploration we have planned for this year, including the, the bits and pieces that we're funding for the partner pro the, the JV partner programs obviously the option partners have to fund the entirety of those programs um and I, like I said earlier we'll probably I, I you know depending on market conditions but I'd expect another you know at least a million million and a half to two million coming in from the uh in cash and stock from the the current option partners now that can you know that can uh that can change if we've if we bring in new partner companies obviously we'll we'll benefit with uh with the initial option agreement being signed and some some more cash and stock presumably coming in at that point, but that's where we stand today. Mm. Where I'm coming from with this, is, of course, thinking about a raise, but this sounds like you you don't have to raise money this year. No, we're, we're it's it, as far as the budget and the plan is concerned currently um, with the drilling that we've been again minimum fifteen thousand meters of drilling. Throughout the year, uh, our largest single year of uh, a drill campaign ever at Russell and more. And again, um, you know, small amounts going to some of the JV projects were, were fully funded. So no plans to raise currently. Right. Well, no, no plan. That's something I have a little bit of um, maybe unfortunate experience with recently where I'm, I'm asking someone, are you going to raise money this year? And they say, we don't have to. That doesn't mean we're not going to take the money when it's there. So, I mean, if the opportunity presents itself, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose if someone throws money at you, you'd take it. I, I mean, look, if if it's if if the market uh, is ripping higher, right, and you know we we decide that we want to do a lot more drilling, then that's something we would consider. But um, we raised money in December with the intent of spending that, you know, this year covering all of the drilling, all of the work we're doing, as well as and as well knowing that we're going to have. Funding coming in uh, from from the various partner companies. So, no, you know, to answer your question, no, we we are not planning currently to raise money. We we don't need to raise money, um, and uh, we haven't had to do a hard dollar private placement uh, in Sky Harbor since August of 2020. A part of that being the you know the cash that has come in from the prospect generator business, as well as some warrants that have uh, that have come in as well um, uh, that were obviously at lower prices. And so, you know, that's, that's been basically self-funding. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, no, we're, we're in good shape and look, we've got partners paying for a lot. If you look at the total budgets across all the various projects, um, you know, the partner companies are paying for a good chunk of it. Right. 
I wish that was the case for me too, but uh, in my my case, I mostly have to pay for what my wife spent. Uh, but Jordan, this has been a good uh, it's been a good little update. Sounds like we're gonna have a lot to talk about over the next couple of months. So I'll let you do your thing today. What am I forgetting to ask you though? What what else do you want to talk about? I I think we've covered it. I mean, look, I I think just a quick a few final words on on the market on the uranium price right now. I um uh, you know I'm very bullish. Uh, needless to say, going forward, I I think um. We're going to see another leg up, uh, as we saw late last year, and a little bit of uh, you know some choppy waters uh, this year thus far. It's been volatile, but um, you know you're getting. Uh, I, I think uh, you know we're we're working our way through this this bull market. I think it's going to be a much longer, more sustained bull market. I really, really like what I'm seeing right now on the demand side for this commodity. Um, you know, we there's lots of you know industry pundits and experts that have done a fantastic job of emphasizing the the strain and the stress on the supply side. You and I have talked about this extensively. That's still very much there. But there is some really exciting new um, growth opportunities for this commodity in particular with uh, artificial intelligence, the data centers that are required for this emerging industry. Um, we, we, we see nuclear power, particular potentially SMRs is a solution to the, the 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 problem that is the energy needs for this emerging industry we we saw late last year um you know at cop 28 this uh, pledge uh by over 20 com uh, countries to triple nuclear capacity we're seeing reactors coming online in places like china and india but we're also now seeing in particular uh, a lot of life span extensions it, with Western reactors, which is not something we were necessarily seeing even a couple of years ago. So um, the supply side, as we know, does not respond quickly. The demand side, as we've said, uh, and as we as we know, is has always been very durable. It's been robust. It's been predictable. But I think it might surprise to the upside here with some of these new uh, these new industries that are emerging that require a lot of electricity. Good. Um, well, sure. That's going to be it. Uh, I think I'm done with the questions. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, you have a lot going on in the background and hopefully we can get an update from you soon. But for the time being, I'll be I'll let you go. I'll let you drop off as I'll be moving down south a little bit. Well, actually, maybe a lot uh, to a company that, again, needs no introduction. You've seen this company on the barbecue before. And I'm very happy to welcome back Paul Gorenson. He's the CEO of Encore Energy Corp. This is uh, one of the few NASDAQ listed uranium companies. The ticker symbol is EU over there, but the company's dual listed actually. They're also on the TSXV um, under that team ticker symbol EU. Since uh, Paul and I last spoke, Encore can now uh, call itself the newest uranium producer in the United States with uh, production starting in November of last year at the Rosita ISR plant and with another one of their facilities planned to start production by Q2 of this year, with that being the Alta Mesa CPP in uh in south texas that is where some drilling by the way has been happening recently too which is something i hope we can discuss later on in a conversation uh there is no meaningful debt to talk about here but there is about 80 million dollars of uh that's us dollars of cash in the treasury and there is some revenue coming in from the current operations here as well and and hopefully we can talk about that later on as well i also hope we'll, we'll be able to talk about some other things happening in the isr space today outside of encore itself because but well, Paul here apparently skipped kindergarten by the looks of it, went straight to work into the mining space because that's the only explanation as to how he could have built a 30-year career at this at, at his current age of, of 35 or maybe 37. So again, loads to talk about and uh, no time to waste. So Paul, thank you, first of all, for being here. Um, and most of all... Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> well, most of all, I'm, I'm, I'm a pleasure. So mine, of course. And why? Because I, I'm... Trying to understand these recent drill results, um, I've taken up on, as viewers will know, I've taken up a, an interest in geology, and I've been, um, and it's been way harder than I'd expected. And um, I can I can use some help in understanding that, that geology here. What are the um, what are the specific factors that make for this variance in grade thickness here versus most other places in Texas? Well, it's it's not really that unique across Texas. It's really the nature of the ore body itself and the, and the sandstone it's in. We're in the, uh, it's called the Goliad sandstone, relatively a, uh, uh, it's a sandstone that uh, was originally deposited uh, on top of several other layers. And the uranium itself is uh, 
moving from a uh, uh, a deeper sandstone called the Catahoula up faults into the Goliad sandstone. And this uranium is remobilized from a source rock in an oxidized state. And what it's doing is seeking a source of reduction. And when the uranium is in an oxidized state, it's soluble. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, it's looking for some kind of geochemical contact that where the, the water becomes reduced or without oxygen and the uranium precipitates out on, at that location. Where we're at, we have these structures that come up from those deep, deeper sandstones that not only create the pathway, but also create pathways for uh, what we call reducing environments. It's a uh, hydrogen sulfide based uh, 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 systems which come up through the natural gas flowing, you know, flowing up into these deeper from these up into the shallower aquifers, creating these really strong geo, uh, geochemical contacts that occur. And uh, <clears throat> because of the age of the formation, the, the uranium is moving relatively quickly through the formation. Uh, and it's as it's contacting these reduction zones, it continues to be remobilized as water, oxidized water continues to uh, come in. And that's in the shape of these roll fronts. They're not straight lines. They're actually, they're, they're, uh, they kind of form a, almost like a, a, a river or a stream, it looks like from a plan view. And then on top of that, you have different layers of the sand within the Goliad sandstone. So the Goliad sandstone is roughly a uh, thousand feet thick, and you have it broken up with clay layers in between that create these kind of confining layers. And within those confining layers, we have roll fronts forming on these geochemical contacts. And depending on how the water moves through each one, these roll fronts don't lay on top directly on top of each other as they stack. They kind of offset each other depending on what's going on uh, hydraulically and other things. So when you, I mentioned to you, it looks like a river or stream. Think about those layered on top of each other, but offset in various directions, either inward or outward or whatever. And it almost, you know, I've, it looks like a, a nest of snakes, or I've told people a, a rather disorganized bowl of spaghetti. And uh, so as they layer on top of each other, and depending on how the water's moving through, you'll get these, at these contacts, the uranium will begin to con concentrate. And what we've seen is that the, the density of drilling we used for the original 43101 that was used to, to develop the 43101 report was based on rather uh, a little bit longer spacing between wells uh, or fences where, where geologic contacts were made. And as a result, as we began to put in a well field, we're looking at delineating and making sure we're high grading, not high grading, but putting the uranium right into the uranium, the, I'm sorry, the patterns, the well field patterns, right into the uranium ore body. So we get the best of most efficient uh, recovery of the uranium uh, with our with our alkaline uh, leaching system. The uh, what you see is that as the what you're seeing really is a normal phenomenon of the Alta Mesa deposit, where as these roll fronts they weave back and forth along these contacts, usually when they come. There's a trend that the water's moving from the, the northwest to the southeast, if you look at it from a, a plan view. And where you get the water coming, they basically like think about banks of sand as you as you move water moves through and is eroding sand and start or the wind, even for that matter, piles up the sand. It piles up where there's a resistance, right? Where it's being kind of constrained. We have the same thing here. So the water, as the roll front is is moving uh with this contact it's starting to build up where the, the water starts to slow down and uh, and it concentrates. And so, well, that's when we started drilling out there, I, I wasn't surprised by the result, these better grade results we're getting because it's typical for out there, but it was very hard. When you look at the density of drilling we did for the 43101, that was done for the 43101 report, uh, it wasn't dense enough to be able to pick up this this change and and the, and the, the for lack of a better phrase, the geology or the sediment sedimentation of the uh, of the contacts, and um, so it builds on these these banks on a, what I would call the southern flank of these roll fronts as they bend back and forth along that contact from north to south, and uh, and 
and it's uh it, it creates it creates these really thick but also thick zones but also stacking where the roll fronts are starting to stack because everything's starting to slow down and begin to stack up rather than kind of being spread out uh as uh, the uh, as you would see on other portions of that particular ore body it begins to stack up and that's why we've seen the roll fronts begin to thicken we couldn't pick it up with uh less dense drilling but as we're putting in the well field obviously we want to refine where things go and what's really helped us quite a bit is being able to use our prompt vision neutron technology to be able to do those in situ assays and get rather than relying on core or using radium or gamma radiation as a proxy for what the uranium is we're actually getting real actual assays of uranium in situ and that's giving us a really high constant level of confidence in our data and what you'll see is that it'll come out in the fact that we'll, when we put the wells in, the well field and turn on the well field patterns and turn on the oxygen within days, you'll start to see that the uranium recovery immediately begin to increase dramatically because we've been able to assure that that all that capital we've put in and all that water we're moving to, we're moving the chemistry through is, is focused on the ore body. And uh, so it, it's it's exciting results. Uh, like I said, I wasn't surprised. I was anticipating it, but I was I was pleased by the level, the the the, the uh, how well the the numbers come out. So I was expecting something probably kind of mid, you know, in that four to five GT range. But we had some peaking out at eight GT plus, and that's uh, pretty exciting uh, because it's just something. It's a it's a pleasant surprise to have. Mm. Is it that I've, I've, by the way, never seen an organized bowl of spaghetti, so it's kind of hard for me to to imagine a disorganized one. So I'm imagining the snakes here. Is uh, is the alteration system of the higher grade zones different than the alteration system at the lower grade zones? No, it's the same. It's just uh, it's just how the recovery comes out, how quickly, and what what the level of production it comes out. So when we produce these ore bodies, we're sampling the well, uh, the wells, the fluids coming out of the, the recovery wells. We sample them for a uh, grade, so uh, in milligrams per liter of uranium, and the and so what we find is that when we get these higher GT holes, those grant we could be instead of measuring a hundred part or parts per million or hundred milligrams per liter, we could easily be doing measuring one gram a liter or a thousand gram parts per million, uh, depending on where you're at on the geometry and everything else of the patterns. But uh, we can see a high, much higher grades. Uh, coming out of those wells through the lifetime, so lower grade typically will have have a, a you know a, a le they'll peak at a lower height, head grade, uh, but the the shape of the curve, the coin curve, will be about the same no matter whether where it's at on the ore body. But you know it's also a matter of kinetics and material balance. So if I have, if I'm moving water out of and I'm going to use U.S. units rather than metric because I'm that's what I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. And for moving out water at a 45 gallon per minute rate out of a recovery well, and one's in a high grade high grade area and one's in a lower grade area, you're still moving the same mass of water. But you have more uranium in the higher grade one, so it's going to take longer to get that that basically move that mass of uranium that's in the ore body out to the surface over the same period of time. So you I mean over the, at this using the same quantities. So it's going to take more time to get it out, but it gives us longer life. But the higher grades reduce over that period of time reduces our operating costs significantly. Uh, but it's just a matter of how you you know it's we see this all the time when we operate these well fields. It's a it's pretty much a, you know typically you get a, a spread across from low grade to high grade, and it's all directly corresponds with the geology. Uh, but uh, you also have the other thing we need to understand is we're not pulling the ore out of the ground like you would in a conventional mine. We're locating this ore body, and I mentioned to you, the, these also, the key thing is these ore bodies typically run 30 to 40 feet, 30 to 50 feet wide and, and width, and are typically uh, about eight feet thick. And so it's relatively narrow targets we're going after. So if you think about coming from the surface, identifying a target at 500 feet uh, with a hole that's only six and a half inches in diameter, we're doing a pretty good record on 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 getting hitting the, the ore body, but you also are trying to estimate what that resource number is there based on our geology and our 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 model that we use for 
estimating the resource. We use a GT contouring model that allows us to be able to uh, estimate our resource. And uh, obviously it gets better with the more, with the more uh, control you have with data. And, uh, but it's still, that's why you see some areas that have lower grade, higher grade, but also you see a, a range in how they recover as well. Mm -hmm. I probably went from A to B through Z on that one, but uh, uh, it was a long discussion about something that's fairly simple uh, when you actually look at the, the data coming in. But it, it, it's essentially those are what you would call the diagenic processes then? I mean, it's happened because it happened that quickly or what would that, is that what you call that? Say that again, I, I think. Would you call it, did this happen through diagenic processes that led to that localized enrichment within some of those uh, yeah. rocks? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's just, a, it's really a factor that the, the, the grade, the, the, the process to get it, it's just a continued building. So the uranium is moving in the oxidized state, and just think about this kind of a pile, like you're sweeping a floor almost. You, you know, you've got a pile of dust you're moving. The uranium is, if you picture, if you can visualize that, it's going to continue to accumulate. And if there's nothing, if there's nothing stopping it, then, then the, the pile will begin to disperse, right, as you're moving it. But if there's something slowing it down, like a geograph, uh, a geologic fault or a pinch out or something like that, the uranium begins to really thicken up pretty good and and the grade begins to increase because it's continually pop the uranium on the sand grains you have to think about it it's a if you if you look at a sand grain you see a sand grain you see one black spot on it on a sand grain that's your that would be typically the uranium that's on it not you know i'm being very general on it it's not coating the whole sand grain it's just like a spot and there's other things like iron and everything else that coat the outside of it when you get this uranium build grade building up the 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 love the amount of coverage on that sand grain increases with uranium less with your the iron and other species other other minerals and so that's why you get it because it's given time to precipitate out and as it slows down and uh, and so where you see higher velocities of water moving through the formation you get lower grades because it's it's sweeping through a little faster than you do where it begins to pinch out. And so we look for those. That's what we look for when we're drilling. And you know, you, the really cool thing about working on the, the Goliath formation is because it's so young, the iron species are very reactive. And so you get a dramatic change in colors and the, and the cutting, so when you're drilling. So it gives, you can get actual visualization, visualization of the geochemistry as the cuttings are coming out of the ground. Uh, because in, and when the, the ore body was originally set before the, the the structures, the faults and everything were formed, it's all pink. That's a hematite color. So it's a, a light pink or color. And then when the geochemistry, when a, the faults come in, then the iron, the sulfides move up and all the iron species turn into a, uh, a pyrite or a marcosite and they become black or gray. So it becomes a, the, the colors are very distinct. But as this water, oxidized water, bringing the uranium through, continues to move through, it doesn't stay static. Now you re-oxidize that formation and the iron gets oxidized again. And so you start building these zones of re-oxidation and the uranium continues to move through the geo to the geochemical contact. And so the iron species changes colors again. It becomes an orange or a yellow color. So we look for those in the cuttings to give us our proximity, it's almost like when you think, you know, liken it to playing Battleship or whatever, the game Battleship. It gives us a not only the geo, we can get an idea of where we're at on the roll front relative to the roll front before we even run a, a downhole probe in the hole by looking at the cuttings. And for me, it's, it's something I like to take people when we when they come out for site visits and everything, take them out to where the drilling is. I can show them uh, on a horizontal, walk them across the roll front. And they can see the cuttings and how the, the colors change in those particular horizons as you walk across that roll front. And they can see how it goes from pink to yellow or orange to, to black and sometimes just gray. And it gives an idea and, and you can, you know, you probably can pick out where that roll front is based on just a general colorization with experience. Take some experience. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but uh, it's it's really cool to do. I, I enjoy showing people that, and it gets the most. Uh, then I get a bunch of uh, new uranium jowlers form, you know, wanting to join us because they get excited about stuff like that. Well, it, it feels like it's on that, but it feels like I certainly bit off more than I could chew off that disorganized bowl of spaghetti there. Um, but it's what it what it comes down to. Where I'm coming from with these questions, even why I'm trying to understand this, is basically understand. Um, whether this in any form is going to influence your uh, decisions moving forward in terms of recoveries, like is is it? But it doesn't sound like it's different metallurgy here, so it doesn't sound like it's going to influence your recoveries. That's right, and so uh, no, it, it it does influence how we design our patterns. So when we put our injection and recovery well patterns, that the the way we interpret where the ore body is going, and it's driven by these drill results, right? Uh, and and they interpret where we're using that ge uh, great thickness uh, contouring uh, kind of model for uh, for mapping out the ore body. Uh, we we use that to optimize where our patterns go. So if we have a high grade hole and it fits the geometry we're expecting to see, we'll case that hole. So now we've locked in a grade into a location, right? And we know that we're going to be able to produce uranium from that one. It's a matter of getting the patterns to fit. And um, and we, we've we spent a lot of time and, and effort, you know, researching and modeling and uh, to ver verifying that the layout because we it's really important we get that right. The reason I say that it's very, once you, the drilling of the drill holes is relatively inexpensive from a perspective of our operation expenses and everything else. But once we just make the commitment to put casing in the well, to put it to make it a produce recovery well or an injection well, that's a commitment. That's a financial commitment. To, it's a thirty thousand dollar decision on each one, and then once you make that decision, you're going to have to complete it and everything else and put it into production. And so you want to make sure you get it right before you make that decision. So everything's we do a lot of work on the the, the up front end. To make sure that uh, we're getting it right, because the, when, I, when you look at it from an operating perspective, uh, you've got the capital capex, and then you've got the operating expenses. The longer it takes you to recover that uranium out of the ground because you maybe missed a port of, or or the more dilution you create in that pattern, uh, in other words, areas where there's no uranium that you're moving water through, consuming chemicals, the more your operating cost is going to stretch out the operating cost. But the other thing that that, that's important to us is on the back end. When we get to the when we believe the patterns are depleted, we have to recover. We have to restore the groundwater. So every gallon of water that's been contacted by, or every cubic yard or foot of uh, of ore body that's been contacted by uh, this the, the the leaching solutions, we have to go and clean that back up to background. And so we want to make sure whatever we're doing, we're getting the maximum value out of it from front end to back end so that we're not basically wasting dollars. Mm. Okay. Um, would that also change, I mean, what you're pulling out of the ground now, maybe the, the, how the structure of the mineralization, if you will, would that change your initial approach to go for the 59 wells for the initial phase, or is that still the most efficient way? Yeah. Well, the, the, the 59 wells we're putting in for the initial phase, that's just really a ramp up. So the the uh, the we're going to be adding wells beyond that fifty nine immediately after that they'll be piped in and add in, but we need the fifty nine is the magic number we need to break through the ion exchange the, the ion exchange columns we use are not they're they're older designs they require us to and they're very efficient don't get me wrong they're just a, a, the older different than what we do at Rosita. so we have to do what's called break through those columns so there's a resin bed we have to have enough volume to lift that resin bed and get that bed to expand throughout the 50 feet of height of that column in the water. And so it takes a certain volume to be able to do that. And that's magic numbers between 1,200 to 1,500 gallons per minute. And that's what that 59 wells represents. And then we continue to add wells and patterns uh, behind that to where we get to the top end of that, that capacity in that column, which is 25, those those columns, which is 2,500 gallons per minute. We'll be, then we'll be switching to the next set of columns, 
uh, and it'll continue to add up until we'll keep adding flow, but we'll be doing these segments like that uh, until we get up to 7,500 7, gallons per minute. Hmm. And well, that will put us at that rate of about 1.5 million pounds per year. Okay. What's the main challenge in between those two phases then? Or what's the main thing you have to do? It's just getting get the wells done? put in and getting the piping done. It's really an operational or, 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 or a development task. And uh, it's just a matter of executing, getting it done on, getting it done in time. That's the main thing. Do you think materials shortages might be part of the challenge here? Or are you finding everything that you need? The On the material side, we're doing okay with the material side. Uh, the one thing we need is more drill rigs. And we're we're adding drill rigs right now as we speak, but uh, we need to increase the pace. If you if you look at our production plan, as we've stated in our presentations and everything else, we have a very aggressive production plan, and that's going to take more drill rigs. So we're trying, I'm, I'm getting, acquiring, hiring additional contract drillers to come in, not only at Ultimates, but our other projects to advance them, you know, to get them advancing in a parallel path to be able to allow us to meet what we say we're going to do over the next year, two, three, or five years. Hmm. So is, is, but that's is that a money pinch point. point. Okay. Is that, is that a money thing? I mean, if it's not materials shortages, is that going to get more expensive? It's a, it, it, it's, it's going to get, the spending is going to go up and it is more expensive to operate them with the price of diesel and labor and everything now. So uh, it does cost more to operate them. What, Having you know, we you know, recent news where we did the, the transaction where we were able to leverage 30% of the Alta Mesa project with Boss Energy, yep. uh, that gave us the sufficient cash to be able to execute this, uh, without having to go effectively hand to mouth to, to support to do it. it was, we were being really constrained by trying to man, minimize our amount of uh, need for financing to match our revenue. But by doing this, doing that transaction, gave us the cash to be able to feel confident we can go out and hire drill rigs and know that we're going to be able to sustain the activities. Mm. And that's what's really given us uh, a leverage. You know, it's, I, you know, it just seems like it's taking forever to get the rigs out there, but that's because they have to man them. They have to get them assembled and everything else. But it's it's happening. And uh, we will be make, meeting our targets. Uh, but it's going to be the cash, the ability to have cash allows us to do that. Now we may have material uh, hiccups in the middle in the meantime, but so far they have not been a what I would call a critical path issue, if if you understand what I mean. Sure. Yeah. No, I do. Um, it, and it's a good point that you bring up your your current treasury, if you will. So there's some eighty million dollars in there. As I said at the beginning, that's U.S. million dollars. But you've also just suspended your ATM facility, so you're not gonna be withdrawing any more money, not going to be able to withdraw any more money. Is this sort of a, what, what are you telling the market here? Does this mean like we don't want to raise any money ever again? We want to, you know, use that 80 million, get to cash flow and then not have to raise money again? Or like, how do we see that? Well, we're not, we're not saying we won't ever need money again because there will always be opportunities where having the ability to do a financing will be, make sense, but it's got to be a creative. But right now, with our current revenue plans we have relative, because don't forget, we are selling uranium under our contracts right now, too. And we're making making money off of it. And the, uh, the so we have revenue coming in in conjunction with the cash we have on hand. And as long as we're doing, as long as that is continuing, we, we feel very confident that uh, we're going to need, we, we don't see within our current development plans a need to go back to the market. Uh, to to raise funds uh, capital, does that mean it it won't happen? I who's to say? But right now we don't have the plans. But there may be things that come up. Could be acquisitions, property acquisitions, or asset acquisitions that could come up where it makes sense to be able to go out and re finance that. But it will be accretive. Mm -hmm. It won't be just strictly to keep the lights on. We we believe that we'll be able to keep our lights on with the revenue we'll be generating. Okay, so you think well, basically revenue covers G and E. Um, when do you think that is? Is that going to be this year, uh, this fiscal yeah, year? Yeah, well, we have revenue coming in as we speak. Right, so but is that going to cover G and E results? What's that? Is that going to cover G and E and the other costs like office marketing? It's going to be. It, it 
it's going to cover a lot most of that yes uh the the uh keep in mind we're ramping up production ramping up deliveries and uh through the year uh, we've been blessed with higher sales prices and uh the uh so you're going to see that we'll be you know we expect to be positive cash flowing at towards the end of the year for you know at least by the end of the year uh which is a place we weren't sure we were going to be you know a year and a half ago hmm. yeah that's true. I, I actually thought you you were thinking that you're going to do free cash flow in 2025 well that's what we were projecting back you know a year and a half ago is 2025 but uh, now with higher uranium prices, uh, where they're at, you know, it's it gives us uh, a lot more. You know, it, it, it provides more optionality. Are you guiding any free cash flow for twenty twenty five already? Do you have an idea how much that's going to be? We have not, and and uh, since we haven't disclosed anything, I'm not prepared to to present it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fair point. What about yeah. in in the meantime? Because you say you're going to have to rev. Well, obviously, you're going to have to ramp up the team and so on and so forth. Talk to me about labor shortages. It's often said that we don't have the ISR teams to carry all the ISR productions, something that we can talk about later on as well. But, I mean, you clearly think you have the team. So, I mean, yeah, will labor shortages influence you here in any way? Not in Texas. We we don't have the competition for labor like we have up, we would have up in Wyoming mm -hmm. or South Dakota. And I, I say that because Wyoming, Texas is a fairly big state. It's an energy-centric state. So there's a lot of where we operate. There's a lot of oil and gas activity, or for, you know, uh, oil and gas operations, refinery operations, and and a lot of energy related businesses. So we've been able to attract people from those other segments, and you know, keep in mind labor is labor, and people, you know, some labor work, some portions of your workforce will leave for a for a, a you know salary increase of fifty cents per hour. Uh, we try to provide other reasons to keep them and also helps us recruit people. Uh, and so, although where we're lacking in is, is some key technical positions, positions where we're struggling, not struggling, but uh, where it's harder to find people. And that's in areas like uh, engineering and radiation safety protection and occupational safety, uh, areas where it's very, where the qualifications are very specific to our business. Uh, we we can get some overlap from the oil and gas side, but those are also positions in the oil and gas industry that are highly desired as well for them. So it's very competitive at that level. But from the general of the operations and the, the labor workforce, uh, we've been able to meet it with good qualified experienced people. And uh, we and some of them are people that used to work for the operate at the operations we currently have in prior years. And so even as we've been very fortunate to be able to recruit those people back and they provide the, what I call the backbone, the supervisor and everybody who's training the new hires. Hmm. So we've been very, very fortunate in that. And it's uh, given us, you know, I believe it's allowed us to get to where we're at today and, and it's going to allow us to meet what we say we're going to do out in the future. Well, you talk about 50 cents increases per hour, maybe not something everyone would move jobs for. And then you say we provide other reasons for people to stay what does that look like? Like, find my. Uh... Well, we have we have health benefits, and we have, uh, uh, you know, some of the, our benefits packages are 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 like our our health benefits is pretty pretty good compared to some of our the folks in the industry, you know, not in the uranium industry, but I'm talking about the just general local energy industries. Uh, we have, uh, you know, good insurance. Uh, we have a pretty competitive, uh, you know, we we provide stock options, which allows. Uh, uh, folks to participate and, you know, to, you know, get the benefit of the growth of the company. Uh, and that gives them an incentive to want to, you know, want to be part of a success story. And so we've been able to recruit people and retain them because they, they see Encore as being an employer of choice, of, of their choice, and a, a way they can see growing and, and becoming something part of something bigger because they like our growth story and everything else. It's not just when we talk to investors, but keep in mind where we also have employees who commit, you know, to, to work for us. And so they want to join us because they see a future. Well, I just think they want to join you because of you. Uh, that's what I, <laughs> that's why I would join if I was a radiation specialist. Um, luckily for my wife, I'm not, Maybe unfortunately for her, depending on how you look at it. Gee, are you look? Are you getting any local opposition, like a, a people 
you know, waiting there, holding up banners, something among those lines. Any any of the locals not happy? Not where we're at, no. Uh, we haven't had any issues with respect to that. In fact, we have very strong local community support. Uh, one of the reasons why is that where we operate, the the economies of those areas where we operate are relatively, you know, they, they're princ like I mentioned, they're principally driven by energy, oil and gas, uh, or other types of business such as livestock or or other industries, smaller industries. So we make a very positive, direct economic impact where we operate. And uh, in the oil and gas, it's highly cyclical. Uh, right now, with gas prices where they're at, not a lot of drilling going on in our part of the country. So the and so the county, the county governments, the local economies really need that that boost. Because one of the things we do also do is we keep people in, in local. They stay local. We hire locally. We keep people local. And so when uh, we we pay our not only pay our employees, but they go back home. They spend their money in the local economy. They, those taxes help pay for the schools, for the overall infrastructure and everything that's in the area. So it really makes a positive impact. So the 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 local communities really want us there because of the economic impact we have. And uh, because these counties have are, are some of the poorest counties in the state, we actually make a measurable and observable economic impact, which is why they want us there. Hmm. A good, you know, if you want to get an idea of kind of how that manifests itself, we did the the grand opening at uh, Rosita back in February, and uh, we had only expected about 180, 150 to 180 people show up. We had over 300 people show up hmm. and a lot of those were local people from the local community. And, uh, and that was important because, you know, it was really important to talk to those folks who had previously had no contact with us, had a sudden really strong interest in what we're doing to bring, you know, jobs, economic development, even local neighbors because of us operating there uh, the county is incentivized to improve the roads and everything else. So their access and everything, their their infrastructure improves as well. It's kind of a knock-on effect uh, uh, from uh, our activities. So it's uh, we've had a lot of very you know very strong support. It's been very very satisfying to see that um, because you know it, because we built such goodwill. Mm. Well, I contemplated coming there myself, but I was I was there mentally. That's for sure. That's um, all right. It's uh, you're welcome you... to come anytime when you're on the side over here in the states or North America. That'd actually be very fun. I've only been to North America once, um, but I am potentially planning a trip where I, I I go and visit a couple of projects, potentially an operating mine. Too much in the works. Not going to say too much about that. But uh, let's go back to production here for a second. Um, of the production that you have going right now that you hope to have by 2025, what part of that is already sold forward? Pretty much everything from 2024 and 2025 is sold forward. But we have to keep in mind that they are on market-related contracts. So we are getting, for the bulk of most of what we're selling, is getting spot prices, current spot prices. Uh, there's some that have that we've hit ceilings on that'll that'll come in, but it's a small portion of what we're actually selling, and uh, and so uh, we're committed to to forward sales probably 100 through four 24 25 and 26 it begins to open up, you know where it's a portion. If if you recall, our our sales strategy is, fo is centered around having roughly half of what we say we're going to produce our, our our production plan to be contracted. It's going to be more like a cap in at just under a million pounds per year as we go out on the count, you know, out in the years. It's going to be a relatively small portion, but it's sized just right so that if the market, something drastically changes in the market, we're able to sustain and operate the investments we've already put in. Maybe not go to, you know, maybe not, maybe defer expanding production uh, to respond to market conditions, but the, the, the contracts we have with, with floors in them allows us to uh, be able to sustain that. So we kind of balance that, but we have the ability to ramp up to meet what we say we're going to do. But if markets don't respond or something happens like that, we have something to assure that we're not going to be without revenue. Mm. And the whole point of that is, uh, but 
the whole point is that just to have a good financial model going forward. The uh, but we also want to have the ability to take advantage of market opportunities, and that's why we're capping the amount we're going to forward sale. We always knew that we're going to ramp up into our forward sales for 24, 25. That was our plan all along. But then going 26 and beyond is always have excess uh, production to be able to either sell in the spot market, hold as inventory, or find other other opportunities where we can get value out of it. Hmm. What's the what's the cap? Like what, what percentage of that eventually five million pounds would you want to have market related versus we're, we want to we're gonna basically limit it to no more than fifty percent of that. If you, you want to use five and a half five million pounds and two and a half million pounds would be be the upper limit that we would have committed for an annual basis. That'll vary depending on contract book and everything else. Uh but uh our point is we want to make sure that we keep le significant leverage available to us to the market hmm. uh, as as it seem, as we see see it opportunistically. Well, tell me more about that strategy behind that. Like, what? Why is it not ninety ten? Like, why, why don't you just go or maybe one hundred percent just go market related? No, no ceilings. Well, no floors. There's a good reason for that. Life experiences. <laughs> uh, I've worked. I, back in the, the mid 2000s, when the price last run up in the price, uh, we I uh, I was running a uranium company for a private company, and uh, it was mostly completely unhedged to the market. It was great when the price was moving up; it was fantastic. We were setting the price, we were doing auctions and everything else. But once the market turned, and that was mainly due to the uh, uh, the fact that the overall economy was changing and, and several of the hedge funds, which were driving the price up, had gotten their margin calls. Then suddenly we're competing against those people trying to liquidate assets. And revenue was pretty slim. You know, you go put material spot mark, put material in the spot market because we're unhedged. What am I doing? I'm driving the price down in order to sell it because I don't have any willing buyers. And the whole point of our contracting strategy is we always have, for a portion of our production, a willing and 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 a willing buyer. In other words, you know, I don't get in a situation like we saw a couple of months ago or a month ago, where where the uranium price is at a hundred dollars a pound and drops twenty bucks a pound because there was no buy, real buyers in the market to buy. There were some sellers that were there that wanted to move material, take advantage of pricing, but they had to keep driving their their ask down. Until they got it, until they got a bid to match it, and I was, but and if there's not any active buyers in the market, or, or it's more than just discretionary buying, you're always at the mercy of the spot market. Hmm. By the structure of our contracts, at least for a portion of our production, we have a a a required buy, a buyer that's required to buy from us, and so we don't have to go in and push material into the spot market to sell it. I've got a buyer who's going to buy it, and it's going to reflect market prices. And that fifty percent number, I don't assume it's arbitrary. Like that's a a number where you can pay all of your production expenses, yes. including the the production expenses of the pounds that potentially don't. I mean, wait for a home, maybe don't get sold immediately. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's part. Of, that's what the strategy is built around: is to have that flexibility and have that, have that. You know that that. I guess. Uh, that have the opportunity that sits there in that between what we're going to be committed to and, and what we have the ability to do whatever we want to do with it. Do you think your colleagues and, and the other producers are going to be smart that way too? Or do you expect that towards the latter part of this bull market, we're going to see a lot of companies trying to do it 100% market-related contracts? I think that's what you're seeing right now is market-related contracts uh, that are going to be out there. Uh, most people don't want to, you know, I don't think there's going to be much in the way of fixed price or base escalator pricing uh, that you see being contracted right now, simply because there's so much volatility in the market. People want to have the ability to have the suppliers, you know, we're finding a supply driven market and uh, <clears throat> we're actually a demand driven market. And uh, that means that the suppliers are, you know, can set their prices now, obviously within reason. You got to be able to get the willing buyer on the other side, but where I see most, at least from our my conversation with buyers, market related seems to be what they're willing to do 
uh, at the moment because they don't want to lock in a, a extremely high price. They want to, you know, they're, they're, they're concerned that today is a high price that the price could drop. So they want to have some of that protection. So that's kind of what you're seeing. And I think that when you talk to other, other companies, that's probably where you see their strategy built around it. If they're not, assuming they're contracting. Hmm. Not everybody's contract. Everybody has different philosophies. You know, you know, we got we got some that are going completely unhedged, and you've got others that contract 100 percent or 110 percent of what they're going to produce, hmm. uh, depending on their strategy and everything else. And we feel that our strategy, although it seems like it's kind of the middle ground, based on my experience, it's one I see as the the kind of the best of both worlds. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that experience again. Um... Not many people have that much as you do there. What happens after that? I mean, this might be quite quite a bit forward looking here, but I know you're thinking about it. So once you're cash flowing, everything's running as planned, you're at that five million pounds a year. What do you do with that money? You give it back to shareholders or are you grown the company to ten million pounds? What how do you see it? I think that that's probably pretty early. I, I don't, you know, yeah, you know, the the uh uh you know, we, we focus strictly on our, our current profile production and everything else. I would expect that there's there's cash that's sitting in the bank that, the, you know, that we want to make sure that our shareholders get the benefit from it. And not just from selling their stock, obviously, but uh, maybe see see some some money coming back to them. Uh, but it's still so early. I, I haven't even put that into the business plan. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's f- future growth. As you've seen our growth of our company every year, We've been doing something significant with respect to to mergers and acquisitions or or financing like we did with you know the transaction like we did with boss energy. Uh, a lot can happen between now and then, so I don't really want to get kind of committed in one place versus the other. Mm. When you talk about m and a and where I'm what why I asked you that first question was because I'm just wondering is it dividend? is it m and a is it? you know, own exploration, or is it a mix of those three? Um, so this actually might be a good segue into talking about your own projects, because you, you've got plenty of ground that you can explore yourself, how big of a, how, how big of a part uh, of your strategy is, is exploration on your own projects for you now? Actually, Brown, it would be basically stepping away from existing, you know, where we know we've got resources. Uh, a good example is a portion of the property came with Alta Mesa, the Mustang Grande section of the segment of the, the f- facilities. You know, we in there we have uh, in the forty three one one we have significant inferred resources over fifty two miles of trend. But I can tell you right now, we need to go spend some money in drilling out there because it's going to. I think it, that resource is going to pr- pr- grow dramatically with some with drilling. And uh, not only are we going to be able to put some of that in production, but it's going to provide a longer life, long, greater opportunities down the road. We have the same situation with some properties we're, we're acquiring in Wyoming, as well as uh, some of our projects where we can grow our projects or grow our resource and potentially bring on new projects that we don't have currently in our production plan. But we see the opportunities right now. And so we're, 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 le- we're looking at that, and that's what... Those will be the places where we see our biggest growth that five, 10 years out. But we need to invest now because it takes time to transition those from uh, exploration project uh, properties or development properties to future production properties. It takes time to do that. And so uh, we know what we have right now in our basket, but we want to make that basket bigger. Uh, And I think with everything we've done, so what we have right now, Plus, we'll be doing some creative, very likely doing some creative act property acquisitions uh, to to add to that area we have to increase our potential resource base. I think that we're going to be able to see some long term growth. Right. What do you think about some of the other ISR projects that are being developed uh, now? Maybe from a technical perspective, but also from an M and A perspective. Would you specifically want to see an ISR focused company? Um, irrespective of jurisdiction or would would that not matter as much to you well obviously you know we've 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 uh stated pretty clearly that we want to stay focused with isr not get into the conventional space mm-hmm. jurisdiction is really important for us and the reason why i say that is because you need some certainty as to where you're going to how you're going to develop and operate a property a property 
And you may have experienced players on the other side uh, that, you know, the counterparty may have, you know, good properties, but, and they may be in pretty good jurisdictions, but if the regulatory, you know, the regulations and the, the way it's being regulated have not matured for ISR technology, then there's a real risk to the project. And so, Unless you know part of that that acquisition, we bring in the ability to to take that that project and take it from concept to development to to reality, uh, and that's what we bring to the table with that acquisition. Uh, we want to make sure we're in an area where we've got you know we're working in areas where we have certainty around what we do. That's why we folk, you hear us talk a whole lot about Texas and Wyoming. Is because those are agreement states, so we're dealing with just the state agencies for the bulk of what we're doing. With very little federal involvement. You know, our, our our federal government, you know, the regulators of the federal government are, are, are pretty good, but it sometimes it feels like this is all new to them. Whereas our state our state regulators, their experience, programs are mature, things move faster, move better, uh, better better cooperation, better communication. Uh, that we don't see with the federal government. So that, that's why we look at jurisdiction very closely, re regardless of where it is in the globe. Uh, we also, you know, and the other things that don't always get talked about uh, when we talk about jurisdiction is also the ability to access supply, reliable supply chains and be able to get our uranium from production to market. Uh, there are some places where in the world where that's pretty difficult. And, uh, we feel, you know, I'm very pleased with the fact that we're in the United States. We have very certain transportation locations, transportation secure. I don't have to worry about dealing with uh, potential sanctions and things like that because we're all in the United States. And uh, and so we're gonna when we look at M and A, it's gonna be it's it's got to be from the perspective of a creative value, but also that creative value also has to advance our ability to produce and if we're just you know we're not looking to strictly the pounds on the ground if that makes sense to you it that last part specifically makes a whole lot of sense to me i don't think everybody agrees with that because there's definitely people who love their pounds in the ground but uh what i'm asking you specifically was sort of from a technical perspective um thinking specifically about canada and isr because isr can as far as i understand it can work great in, in dry countries because groundwater doesn't interfere with the reagent, but Canada is full of lakes. And so it is a great jurisdiction, but then you have that. So do you think that will prove to be an, an issue once it's it's done at scale? I I, I don't think the, top, the, the the climate will make as much of a difference. Uh, the the It's really going to be what's going to drive the economic development of ISR and can let's say the Athabasca. The one thing that the Athabasca is characterized by is the fact that most of the big significant ore bodies are 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 are, are built around these significant unconformities. And every one of them, I, from my recollection, every one of them is just generally different than the other. And so those unconformities are created by certain geologic ge geologic events that create certain geologic conditions which allow that uranium to be deposited there. Uh, I can take, you know, I, I've seen typical similar uh, unconformities in the in the U.S. in breccia pipes, where the the uranium is put there by a specific geologic event that that caused that uh, and then created that environment. The unconformities are up, you, they're typical for the, the Athabasca are about the same. In order for ISR to work, you have to have access to the surface. So you mentioned about the lakes. If you got a lot of uh, the the ore bodies are under the under under the ground under a lake, getting access to put in a, a well field to be able to, to uh, penetrate and put into the ore body and get that leached, that's a, that's a challenge. It's there. Uh, we don't have that issue down here in South Texas or up in Wyoming, uh, but it could be a challenge. Ground the ability to access the ore body with the in situ process is a challenge. There's ways around it, but it's it's pretty technically challenging. Uh, then the other is is understanding the ore body where it's at and the hydrology to make sure that the, the uranium actually the chemistry that you put in the ground, whether it's acid leaching or if it's if it's uh, alkaline leaching like we use in the states, uh, the chemicals you put in the ground actually have to contact the ore and move through it and come out to the surface. 
And the nature of some of these unconformities, you may not get the hydraulics that work right. And again, I don't know enough technical about it, but at least, you know, when I worked for Cameco, I got to see the geology for, centered around Cigar Lake and also the car at the river, which are completely different between the two. Uh, and so, as is their mining techniques are completely different. ISR is similar to that. You have to have the right geology to make it work. So if you have a lot of fractures or there's just a, the unconformity is a balled up mess, so like what you see with Cigar Lake, you know, big, not, I shouldn't say balled up mess, but kind of just a big sand blob full of uranium, uh, you may not get efficient leaching. And so those are some of the conditions without my general knowledge of knowing specific project wise, What's there in general, we the what we have in the in the States and what, what they use in Kazakhstan, they rely on these sedimentary deposits where the roll fronts are laid out with confining layers so the chemistry can be contained with that where that ore body is. And they know they're able to contact the ore and get the uranium with the chemistry and get the uranium in the solution and produce it to the surface. It's very predictable, understood. Uh and uh uh, what works in Kazakhstan, at least uh, from the geology perspective, you know, the overall broad geology's perspective, generally works here in the U.S., works in Australia uh, because they're saturated, they have water. Uh, but uh, what's different up in the Athabasca is the fact that those ore bodies are, are deposited. So, you know, from my understanding, and I'm not an expert in it at all, uh, is that the... Uh, is that you don't get the same type of uh, layering and confinement to allow this the ISR process to work efficiently underground in situ. Hmm. You, looking at some of the preliminary tests that we have, specifically the tests that are testing the ability to make that happen at scale, have you looked at those and did, do you have trust in, in the way they've been built? I've looked at some of them on a limited basis. Uh, I have not looked at how they intend, you know, any kind of, uh, I've seen some of the results, but I have not seen how they intend to utilize those results to put into a development plan. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to, to really kind of state clearly as to what my opinion is on one site versus another, one operator versus another. Uh, in general, you know, I still think that uh, kind of what I see is that uh, really they're kind of the preliminary level of just making sure the water will move from point A to point B. It works pretty well when the wells are pretty very close together, how they react from, you know, with distance between them, which would be practical, you know, practical pattern size. Uh, it's still hard to see that going out on a linear basis, you know, being able to model that out linearly. I think the other thing is, is that uh, how efficiently is that? It, it's what's not clear in the results that are presented because they haven't actually done chemistry, you know, added acid to or anything to dissolve uranium into the ore body it's hard to tell how efficiently efficiently how efficiently it's going to leach mm. i think that's one of the considerations that's there the other one is is that when you've got these significant ore bodies a lot of water in them you know we talked about freeze freeze walls and everything else to contain the solutions and everything is that is that practical I don't think that's been fully vetted. I mean, you know, from a perspective of uh, how practical it is. Uh, I've worked at Cameco. I've seen what the work they do at, uh, at MacArthur River and, and Cigar Lake. And I could tell you that the quality of the work they do is very good. Don't, you know, it is very good, but it is a lot of work they do. They put in their freeze walls, take a lot of effort, engineering and everything else. And is that something that's amenable for doing an ISR recovery? And again, those are all type of things I don't have the, the luxury of seeing the plan, so to speak. And then looking at the regulator, I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the you know Canada does not have what I call mature even you know regulations for in situ recovery. Uh, Australia did theirs, but they based those on what the U.S. does. The U.S. probably has the most mature. Uh, in such a recovery uh, regulations that are tied to federal law. Mm -hmm. And uh, Australia relied on a lot of what we do in the States to drive their regulations for in such a recovery. Of course, Kazakhstan follows their model that they 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 uh, inherited from the, uh, the the former Soviet Union uh, and, and development work they did already. So it's kind of, you know, 
you've got different drivers and Canada is still relatively new at this. I'm sure they're hiring the right people. I just don't know for a fact. Hmm. That's a very extensive overview. I like your humbleness of saying you worked at Cameco. You're putting it very mildly there. And uh, yeah, Paul, this has been a great overview. I, I appreciate this has been wide ranging. I really appreciate the conversation here where we've gone. What am I forgetting to ask you though? What did you come here hoping to talk about, but I'm failing to bring up? Well, you know, um, I guess I just want to, you know, add that, you know, we, we've, you know, we talked about the drilling results at Alta Mesa. I, I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about some of the the projects we're going to, you know, Rosita's got a good start, but it's, it still needs to, we still need to get it to capacity and some of the properties we're advancing right now, uh, at a, what we call Upper Spring Creek. I'm, I'm pretty excited about, uh, getting those into production. So that I think that from an overall perspective of, uh, the technical activities and the operational activities. I, I've been very pleased with how everything's been going. As you would expect, anytime you do start up a normal operations, there's always surprises. But our team's been able to get past those those uh, those uh, surprises. I mean, professionally and quickly and efficiently. And I can't say more. I can't say enough good things about uh, the ingenuity of the folks that work for me. Uh, the site and and their dedication because we wouldn't be where we're at today without their dedication and and uh, I'm just really looking forward to getting all the makes up and running and getting that uh, growth build, built out and it's exciting times right now. All right, thank you, Paul. This has been fun. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you. Jokes aside, though, I really do always appreciate um, talking to you and hopefully next time we speak. It's less than a year apart, but um, I'm already looking forward to it. In the meantime, though, while on the topic of the NASDAQ stock exchange, I am going to be going uh, back to Canada, specifically Manitoba and Ontario, and also Namibia, kind of at the same time, uh, challenging as always, but I'll try to make it work uh, as I'm talking to Frank Wheatley. He's the CEO of Snow Lake Lithium, uh, Uranium and Lithium Exploration Company. The company is listed um, under the ticker symbol LITM on the NASDAQ stock exchange or change, where an average of about 62,000 shares trade each day with a 52-week high of $3.15 and a 52-week low of $0.42. Cents. With a market cap of, call it $19 million and about 20 million shares outstanding today, this is a $0.91 cent stock. Add to that the 1.7 million options that are, by the way, exercisable at $5.18 as well as 2.2 million warrants at $3, and there's also some RSUs to it, and then you're left with about uh, 24, so that'd be 24.2 to be specific million fully diluted shares. Given that this is a NASDAQ-listed company, I would like to direct you to Edgar, in this case, uh, at sec.gov for the proper disclaimers, as well as the company's financials. Please do actually read them to better understand the financial situation here, because although we'll be discussing it, um, later on in the conversation, things change, and um, and this is a non-revenue generating company, so they rely on the public market for financings, and you should do more research. Again, there are multiple projects here. Uh, the project that the company's name came from uh, is Snow Lake. Uh, well, it's located in uh, Manitoba. It's about 240 square kilometers in size, so it's relatively large. And this is an advanced stage asset. It's, a, it's at the PEA level, and it's 100% owned by Snow Lake. Uh, they, they're actually two deposits that be Thompson Brothers, so I'm going to call it TB from now on, and Grass River, which I'm going to call GR. Uh, they're unsurprisingly not twins, so that TB is a near, nearly vertical tabular shaped deposit. So kind of like a, I imagine it kind of like a very tall pancake that's buried underground. And then GR is basically uh, made up of four separate pegmatite dikes. Together, they are valued at $1.2 billion in post-tax NPV with a post-tax IRR of 170%. There's um, That comes to fruition after a, a CapEx spend of, in total, $146 million, resulting in a payback period of 14 months. What's the catch, you might think? Well, I'm thinking the same thing, so hopefully Frank will tell me more about that later on in the conversation. There's another lithium project in Canada, though this one is um, earlier in, in its Lausanne curve journey, if you will. And this one is made up by three land packages for a total of almost 69 um, square kilometers, which is kind of nice. This is southern Manitoba, specifically on the uh, greater Shatford shear zone, which is situated on the uh, southern 
part of the uh, Bird River Greenstone Belt, I believe. It's um, not too far off from the Tanko Mine there. It's actually on its border. Uh, and Snow Lake does not own 100% of the rights here, but they do have an option to earn up to 90% interest in it through a phased approach of exploration, whereby a 51% ownership can be acquired upon spending 600,000 Canadian dollars in exploration costs within the 12 months, the, the, within 12 months um, from, from, from that issuance of, a, or from the acquirement of that option. And then another 39% can be acquired upon an additional 1.2 million Canadian dollars being spent within the next 24 months. That will then leave uh, ACME Lithium, the current owner of the rights on the project, uh, that would leave them with uh, a 10% free carried interest. Like the previous one, by the way, this is a hard rock lithium target with LCT pegmatite, so that'd be lithium cesium tantalum pegmatites. Uh, and then thirdly, there was another option that was picked up early this year on another lithium project that'd be in Western Ontario, close to the Manitoba border, actually. Not much that I can tell you about this project as it's really mostly a geophysical anomaly for now, but hopefully, again, Frank can update me on it later on. Uh, and then last but not definitely not least, kind of a focus of this conversation actually today is going to be um, our uranium project that's uh, recently come into the mix as well. This is called the, um, I cannot read my handwriting, but I'm sure it's called something with an E and a G in it, Valley Project in Namibia. And uh, Snow Lake has an option on, on it to acquire 85% of what is 683 square kilometers of um, of land on a project that was, by the way, drilled by Glencore in the 70s, where they discovered some mineralization. But because it's really long a long time ago, I'm not allowed to tell you what that is and what those hits actually are. So Snow Lake will have to drill this thing themselves, which again is um, something we're going to be hearing more about later on in the conversation. But before that, um, what I'm wondering here, Frank, is 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 like the first thing that popped to mind when I when I looked at the companies. Why the U.S.? Like why the Nasdaq, and why aren't you listed on the TSX? Um, before my time, the company was taken public in November 2021. I came on at the end of July 2023, so it was al already uh, decided before my time. Um, there certainly is value being listed in the U.S., particularly on NASDAQ. Um, if you stand back and look at the global thematic of critical minerals and the clean energy transition, the EV transition, the United States in particular, as currently the world's leading economy, is now starting to wake up and look at securing its energy supply chain, its critical material supply chain. So ultimately, investors in the U.S. are going to be looking for companies listed on a U.S. stock exchange that have exposure to those critical materials. Hmm. Well, so, so while I, I obviously agree with that, and the TSX and the TSXV have been going through their own set of issues with liquidity and whatnot recently, there are also uh, challenges, and you can call them drawbacks, to being listed on the NASDAQ. It's also, um, apparently, it's a little bit more expensive, too. But for example, you recently had a, a minimum bid price deficiency notice from the NASDAQ that basically tells you that you might get delisted unless you get the share price up over a dollar and sustain it for a, for a period of time. Uh, that period is up by June 4th. What's, um, I mean, what's the plan there? How, how do you get the share price up? Do you want to get delisted and go to Toronto? How, how are you looking at that? We have satisfied that, notwithstanding if you look at the trading price of the company slightly above, slightly below a dollar over the past several months, we did obtain more than a dollar trading for the 10-day period. So we have actually cleared that notice out. Um, however, you have seen our trading pattern go below a dollar recently. So if we stay below a dollar and don't remain above a dollar, we may get a second deficiency notice. But the first one has been cleared. Okay. What's the, well, yeah, I mean, what's the, what's the strategy behind keeping it above a dollar without you having to sort of live in this uncertainty? Like, are we below or are we above? Like, I mean, would insider buying to support the share price be an option here? Do you plan more marketing or something else to, to help it stay above? Certainly one of the things that the company has not had a lot of visibility on is an investor relations program. And that is certainly something that I'm spending a lot of my time on. And particularly given we're coming into field season on our projects, which we will discuss shortly, 
what we believe is we have a number of catalysts, we have a number of milestones, we have a number of exploration projects or exploration programs on our projects rather that will start to deliver results over the next six to nine months through the balance of this year. So that will become the focus of our investor relations program. Up to now, we've been relatively silent other than sort of the acquisition, particularly of the Shatford Lake project earlier this year, and most recently, the Ingo Valley Uranium Project. Ingo Valley, that's it. I can read it now. Uh, yes. Good point. You joined the company, um, I thought it was Ego Valley, and I thought, nah, that's, uh, that'd be W2, Ingo which I'm not going to say yes. that out loud. So, Ingo Valley, good. Um, you joined the company recently, as you just said early on. Did you Have you been buying shares yourself? How many shares do you own? How much did you pay for them? Um, I have RSUs. I have not purchased shares in the open market, but I do have RSUs. And any plans to again to support the share price in this in this time specifically push it above a dollar? It is tricky given I have inside information and I certainly can't be purchasing when I have inside information. As you have seen, we've acquired the Shatford Lake project, we've acquired the Namibian Engo Valley project. We do have other opportunities that are sitting on our desk right now. So I'm probably precluded from buying given that we are looking at a couple more acquisitions. Right. Okay. Well, th well, thank you for the explanation. That's um, I, I like starting it off there, sort of with the understanding the company situation better. Uh, maybe just a, a quick rundown on on cash, debt. How's the financial situation looking? Uh, no debt. We have about five million dollars in cash, Canadian dollars. Okay. What's your What's your typical burden rate? How much are you budgeting for GNA and uh, rest of it? Uh, we're just working on our budget for 2024. Part of it is dependent on how we're going to spend the funds on the projects that we have. So we're in the process of budgeting right now. We're in the project of initiating some of our programs, and we can discuss that uh, on the individual projects in a minute. Right. But the marketing, G&A, office spend and stuff like that, salaries, are you, do you have a budget we're for a that? Fairly, we're a fairly tight ship. It's myself, the uh, interim COO, and the VP exploration. Um, the balance of our services, such as accounting, is contracted. So we have fairly, fairly small bandwidth as far as employees and contractors in-house. So our burn rate is relatively low compared to some other companies that have larger in-house staffs. Could you get more specific on that or, or what you're hoping uh, your total burden rate for this year to be? Uh, not going to comment just because we're in the process of budgeting right now. So I'd prefer to wait till that process is done before I give you a, a burn rate number for the year. Okay. Do you know what the burn rate was in 2023 off the top of your head? No, we're just doing that calculation now. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll be on the lookout for that. Uh, maybe you can, we can talk about it next time you come on. Sure. Um, and apparently you've been invited. I didn't know until now, but now you have. Let's uh, let's maybe talk about the projects that you have then. Sure. Maybe start with the most recent acquisition again, which is a uranium project in Namibia. Um, both uranium and Namibia are of interest to me, uh, have been for a while. But but first of all, Frank, I'd like you to sort of walk me through the deci decision process here as to why you decided to pick this specific project up, because you were... You're a lithium-focused company bef before you joined the company that that that. that Actually, you got involved in the company, not you, but the company got involved in, in the lithium space as the space was kind of getting hot Correct. at the time. But you're now, you're now also going into uranium, and uranium has kind of also been hot. And so what I'm looking out for, I just want to know if this is sort of a flavor of the day type of move, or is there something specific that attracted you to uh, this project? I think it's uh, it's a broader global thematic, and it comes back to what I'm calling sort of the clean energy transition, which is the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy, nuclear being one of those, and the EV transition, which is the transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. One of the driving materials in the clean energy transition is, is uranium. And one of the main drivers in the EV transition is lithium. Company started out as a lithium company. Um, as you know, lithium price has been relatively volatile. The company went public in November 2021. And then during 2022, lithium prices essentially went to the stratosphere. Um, having gone so high at the end of 2022, 2023 saw lithium prices not only come back to earth, but probably bounce along the basement. So that's been challenging for raising capital for companies like ourselves that are non-revenue generating companies. We were fortunate. We did raise money last September 
So we have flow through dollars. We raise Canadian flow through dollars that do have to be spent on projects in Canada. So we were fortunate in that sense. But coming back to your thematic, when the lithium prices fell during 2023, because we were cashed up, we were presented with a number of opportunities, not only in the lithium space, but actually in the uranium space as well. And again, when you look at the global thematic on uranium in nuclear and clean energy, you have to start with geopolitical. Of course, we have the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That obviously focused everyone on energy security and energy supply chains. Then you have issues in Africa with Niger, for example. Then you start looking at the number of nuclear reactors that are being built, the number of small modular nuclear reactor designs that are coming. And essentially, you've got people saying that the path to net zero carbon will not happen without nuclear. Nuclear and uranium is also a critical mineral. So we thought, standing back as a uranium company, which supports the EV transition, a slight addition, if you will, of uranium, which is clean energy materials, makes us more of a clean energy company as opposed to a solely lithium-focused company. So I think we cover off both global thematics, if you will. So that's the ultimate rationale. But to answer your question, when the lithium price started to fall during 2023, as I say, we were presented with a number of opportunities in the lithium space and the uranium space. And the one that struck us in the uranium space was the Ango Valley Uranium Project. And the interesting thing about that is there is historical work done on it by GenCorp, as you indicated, in the 1970s. We do know that uranium mineralization was discovered. We do know the grade and the calculations that GenCor did. As a NASDAQ-listed company without an SK-1300 report, I can't tell you those numbers. But if you Google Engo Valley Uranium Project, or if you look at the Namibian Ministry of Mines website, you will actually see reference to the Engo Valley Project, and you will see the historic resource calculation and grades. So it is actually available on the internet if someone wants to look. So I guess standing back, what attracted us about Namibia? Namibia, very good jurisdiction in Africa, third largest uranium producer globally in 2022, I believe. It has two existing uranium mines. A third one it was on care and maintenance. They're trying to bring that back on. And they have just granted mining licenses for two new projects in Namibia. Um, the U.S., we understand, has just opened a brand new embassy in the capital of Namibia this January, a couple of months ago. So clearly, Namibia is the focus of the uh, U.S. as well. And the other thing is the project is relatively underexplored. And it's not, if you will, a recycled project. It's essentially been sitting on the shelf for the past 40 years. No one has done any additional work on it. So I think the ingredients, as I like to call it, it's a good jurisdiction, uranium producing jurisdiction, mining friendly jurisdiction. We know there's historical mineralization. We know what the grade is and has been underexplored and no work done on it in the past 40 years. Hmm. Hence, we think there's an opportunity to prove up what the mineralization is. What was Gencore looking for? Like, well, why did they drop Uranium. the properties? I mean, well, no, but I mean, <laughs> I get that part. What, what were they looking for specifically that they maybe didn't find or didn't like for them to drop the properties later on? I mean, again, I don't know what the mandate of the program was. We do know what work they did. We have some of the historical reports. Most of those are available on the Namibian government website, so they're available for people to read. Um Again, if you look at exploration technology and techniques over the past 40 years, they've dramatically improved as far as you know exploration goes, particularly with respect to uranium. So I think it's a combination of Gencore had multiple assets at the time around the globe. They were obviously looking for uranium in a good spot in Namibia, um, found some, but for whatever reason decided that it didn't warrant further expenditure to continue the exploration. Hmm. That'd be, it'd be interesting to get more insight into that. I, I'll 
I'll look that thing up, of course, knowing that that's historical information there, and that should be taken yes. with a grain of salt, of course. But yeah, and you're currently doing an exploration program there, a lot of um, desktop work in the early stages, as far as I understand it, of course. But you, you also mentioned that you you, you RC drill, well, re-drill, really, some of the historicals, essentially twinning them. What's the what's the point in that? What kind of an what kind of a question do you hope they're going to answer for you? Well, maybe I'll just talk about the program generally. Um, the Namibian government did fly airborne surveys of the entire country, and that data is available for purchase. We have acquired that, and we're in the process of having that data analyzed. That, of course, sets out targets and will confirm some of the on-the-ground targets that GenCor was pursuing back in the 1970s. The next part of the program will be ground geophysics. And again, that's the ground truth, the airborne, as well as to focus in on additional drill targets. Um, of the five diamond drill holes that GenCor drilled back in the 70s, we do know where two of the collars are. So we'll be able to twin those. Um, again, you have to remember that the 70s was pre-handheld GPS. So we'll be able to triangulate where the other three holes were approximately. Um, but we do hope to twin those holes and we do hope to do some infill drilling between those holes based, of course, on what the ground geophysics tells us as well. The ultimate objective is to prove up an SK-1300 compliant mineral resource estimate. Hmm. Do it, and what you're going to do this year, is that going to, well, I assume that's going to be enough to keep the option agreement going? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. The uh, the amount of work that we're going to do this year is more than enough to uh, keep the option. And hopefully, again, we've got the drilling set up in two phases. Um, the initial phase will be twinning the, the original five holes as well as some infill drilling. Depending on the results of that, we're looking at going back in and doing a second phase. But obviously, we want to do the first phase, get the assay results. The ultimate target would to be would be to see if we can have an SK-1300 mineral resource estimate by the end of 2024. Mm. Okay, by the end of 2024, that's uh, that's aggressive Q4 2020. Why why twinning those holes though? I mean, that's typically frowned upon in the industry when you, when you see it in, in gold projects that might be recycled or whatnot. Why are you twinning them? Uh, basically, we know there's mineralization in those holes, um, but it's 40 year old data. So we would like to get some current drill hole data on that. And we also do some downhole radio metrics as well on those holes. Okay. Uh, how long is that going to take you to to come up with, with assay results? Uh, that all depends on the assay lab. Right now, the, uh, the contractors are in the process of mobilizing. We hope to have the ground crews, uh, the ground geophysics crews on site by the beginning of May. That will probably take six weeks or so. We hope to have the drillers on site sometime mid to late May. Okay. Um, assay results, uh, We, I believe we're going to be using a lab in South Africa. Um, so I believe that the assay results, again, dependent on the uh, flow of material through the labs, could take a number of weeks. So Don't have an estimate on that right now. If I say by I mean, the end of July, you're hoping to have results. Hopefully that that would be yeah that would be encouraging if we could get the uh, assay results back by then. Mm -hmm. Then that would allow us to go back in and plan the uh, sort of the second phase of drilling. Well, it, it's RC drilling though, and it's um, correct uh, undeep. Basically, it's not deep. Uh, so I, I assume you're going to get it done quickly, right? It's not that many holes. It's not that many meters. It's not deep. Yes. It's RC. So. So how long do you think it like a, a week uh, to get it done? Or oh, like... no, it's going to be several weeks to to do the drill program. As I say, if they're on site in mid-May, it would probably be a month to complete the drill program. Again, the project is located up on the Skeleton Coast, which is the northwest corner of Namibia. Access is fine, but the material all has to be trucked in. So they do have to set up a temporary camp. They'll be up there for several weeks while they do all the ground geophysics and the drill programs. Hmm. How much, uh, I know this round is, is the first round is mo mostly RC again, but how much uh, do you think core drilling will eventually cost per share here, given that it's, uh, and here's also, by the way, we can talk to me about infrastructure, because as far as I understand it, there's a sand road um, about 200 kilometers from the coast. Uh, so yes. it's, it's, it's not nearby. The road is maybe not well developed. And so I'm just wondering, are drillers going to be charging you more for core drilling than they would 
some of your some of your colleagues that are more to the east uh, to the west i'm sorry well well certainly as being more remote the mobilization costs will be more there's no question about that um and and again all of the access as you say is is well trodden access it is accessible there's no issues there um, all of the heavy equipment does have to come in by truck. We do understand there is an airstrip 80 kilometers from the uh, from the project site. So we'll be able to bring some supplies in by air, but the majority will come in by truck. Okay. Um, any ideas? Have you looked at any offers or anything that, that you can tell me how much do you, th how much do you think a, a meter of core drilling will eventually cost here? Don't have that. Uh, core drilling would be probably in the second phase. We'll see what the results of the RC. RC, and we have questioned this, but RC is a well accepted form of drilling for uranium deposits in Namibia. Whereas we may be familiar with core drilling in North America or other parts of Africa for gold deposits, for example, um, certainly RC drilling is accepted. Doesn't mean you're not going to be doing some core drilling. But RC is very well accepted, and they have good procedures for analyzing RC for uranium deposits in Namibia. But I suppose it, it depends on the type of deposit you're looking for. There sure. could be different types. So what Maybe this, this is the point where you can talk to me about what you're looking for. What's the main geological thesis here? Uh, again, I'm not a geologist, so I will leave that to the geologist. But we're it is a very large land package. We do know there's two existing targets that GenCorp was exploring and drilled. There is a third target to the south, which has had no exploration, no drilling on it. So those are the three areas that we're going to cover in the ground geophysics, which will help us. In addition to the holes we know that GenCorp drilled, target additional drill holes, particularly on the new target to the south. Okay. Um, I saw in the news release a, a mention of uh, of an alluvial deposit, um, potentially again. So mineralization within alluvial, uh, and it was an alluvial fan deposit, basically. And so what what caught my attention there is is that they can be mineralization within those deposits can be v variable at times, not often, uh, but oftentimes sure. heterogeneous. And so it's typically not as easy to find and and to find them later on. Do you have people on a team who have that specific experience with those um, alluvial fan deposits? Yes, we have a geological group out of Namibia that has, I think, up to 40 years experience exploring for and discovering uranium deposits. So we feel we're in good hands as far as on the ground folks who have the experience, particularly in uranium in okay. Namibia. And they, so were they involved with some of the discoveries or, or something that you can tell me more about? Uh, I do not have their, their history as to the other clients that they've worked for, but they have been in business for a long time in uranium exploration in Namibia. Okay. The yeah. list of clients I do not have for cool. other deposits that they've worked on. Do you have any data about the, the maybe the structural controls that are associated with, um, I believe you called the D1, D2, D3, and D4 anomalies from that historic airborne surveys? Again, geological question. I would have to defer to the geologists on that. I wouldn't uh, pretend to uh, comment on that. Well, this maybe you should get 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 some of those guys or some of your geos on to to talk about these things because they're they're, sure. important. they're interesting too. Um, yep. to kind of understand. I think a lot of it might become clear after the drilling as well. Or kind of like at least feeling that I'm ahead of the curve, which I typically am not. Uh, but but that's where these things are coming from. Sure. Um. Okay. I made a note to ask you about the 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 um, the carnotite as well, but I I assume you defer that question too. I'll defer that to the geologist as well. Okay, yeah. But, and, uh, and look, certainly. You know, again, the project has not had any recent work on it, even though the historical work is available. Some of the historical reports are available on the Namibian government websites, and we have obtained all of those. The geological group in Namibia has gone through all of those, including the airborne work that the government has done. So we do know where the initial targets are. Um, we want to, again, get on the ground, do an updated ground geophysics program that will help us reinforce where the drill targets are. So I think it's your typical exploration progression. We'll do the ground geophysics. We'll do the first round of drilling. We'll get the assay results. We'll see what that tells us. Hopefully, we'll start to get a better feel and confirm what the views of the geology are, which will then help us uh, plan the second round of drilling. So I would hope by the end of the second round of drilling, we'll have a much better idea as to the 
the geological setting, the structural controls, and hopefully an initial resource estimate. Okay. Where I'm, where I'm coming from, though, specifically why I made a note about the carnotite, by the way, is right. because the carnotite is not only a uranium mineral, vanadium is also a primary constituent here. And now that could challenge the metallurgy because, again, I'm not a geologist myself, but as far as I understand, vanadium just kind of likes being difficult, kind of like my wife. But the point was that I'm wondering about met work, and, and so that there's something you would know, but are you doing any met work early on, metallurgical work early on so that you know whether the project is even worth pursuing in the first place? Sure. That is part of the component of once we get the drill results, yes, that'll be, we'll do some initial met work. Okay. Fair point. Um, th this is also where I assume when you're going to have better geological comparisons, because in the initial news release, you, you mentioned some of the big deposits um, in and sure. around you, but it, it'd be better to know what kind of a geological comparison you're you're hoping for, basically. Yep. So yep. I think okay. it's early days, as I say, notwithstanding all the historical work that's been done. I think uh, the advantage of going in with, you know, more modern exploration techniques, more modern equipment um, will certainly help us get a much better feel for what the uh, geological setting is. That will set us up to be able to see if we're comparable to a Rossing or Husab or other mines. Okay. Good. Well, hopefully, again, I can get an update on it sort of towards uh, mid or the end of the summer. Um, yep. Let's talk about something you do know more about, specifically that be your, your lithium stuff, Snow Lake itself. Yep. Uh, because I mentioned at the beginning of uh, sort of in my overview, basically high IRR, high NPV, quick payback, not a huge initial capex off the off the bat. You got to pay 50 mil and then total that'd be 150 if I'm not mistaken. It's a near vertical tabular shaped deposit. Mm -hmm. You see the metallurgy works there too. The market's not giving you much value for it though. What's the catch? I don't think there is a catch. We have an initial resource of 8.2 million tons, uh, grading about a percent, which is a viable or grade. Um, the preliminary economic assessment came out about two weeks after I came on board. And yes, it's got some nice numbers for NPV, nice numbers for IRR. I guess I look at the PA as basically a, a go, no go document. Does this project warrant further exploration development dollars being spent on it? I think the simple answer is yes. Um, what the deposit requires is two things. One, some additional drilling. We do know that both deposits, Thompson Brothers and Grass Rivers, are open both at depth and a long strike. So we need to do some additional drilling to see if we can add additional tons. And second, ultimately, after the drilling, would be moving into a pre-feasibility study. The pre-feasibility study would have some initial engineering, some additional MET testing, uh, be a little sharper pencil on the operating costs and the capital costs, so you'd have a much better feel for what the project economics are, and hopefully a larger resource estimate as well. The other thing you should remember in the preliminary economic assessment the reason that the initial capex is low in the first year is it's talking about DSO. Now that's a direct shipping ore. And that's basically where you dig the ore out, perhaps you crush it, perhaps you sort it, then you send it off to a processing facility. There's really only two choices of a processing facility, Tanko outside of Winnipeg or China. And certainly where Snow Lake is based, there is a rail access up to uh, Churchill. So there is a potential to ship ore to China obviously more expensive than trucking it down to Winnipeg. But that's the basis of, one of the basis of the uh, of the PEA. And that theory behind the DSO is even though it's the lowest value revenue generating project uh, product that you can produce, essentially the revenue from the one year of DSO will offset your first year of capital costs. So essentially it's a wash. That's the theory behind DSO. Ultimately, you would want to build a mill on site because you're giving away a lot of value by shipping DSO as opposed to processing it into, a, say, a 6% 6% spodumene concentrate. But that would be the second phase of the capital cost. And that would be... So, but wait, is that is that included in the PEA? Yes. Okay. Yes. And th okay, so yes. that's why it's 50 mil and then essentially yes. it's almost about 100 million, basically. Yes, about 100 million. million. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you're thinking so that's, operations. That's, you, 
sorry, but just sorry to interrupt, but but that's sort of that you, you will see that in a number of other junior lithium companies. They talk about DSO, and as I say, notwithstanding it is the lowest revenue generating project. What it does is it generally provides that offset for initial capital. So it reduces the amount of finance required, both equity and debt, and smaller capital costs to get that initial revenue stream coming in. I do want to talk about how you plan on financing it um, as we move forward, though. But this is so, – so Snow Lake, obviously, as the name suggests – is your flag was your flagship asset before you came in it kind of still remains it because the most advanced asset yep. but is that do you want to keep it as the flagship asset like is this how you would advance the company forward yeah look it it requires additional work as i indicated uh, the challenge with this past winter is we've had a very mild winter throughout most of canada typically in northern manitoba drill programs are done in the winter typically everything starts to freeze up late october november december you build ice roads. This year, it did not freeze until well into January, February. So in some respects, we basically missed a drill season because of weather. Uh, there have been sort of cold periods, but essentially you need several months of minus 15, 20 degrees in order to set up for a winter drill program. And if you look at the topography of northern Manitoba, it's largely lake country. It's very boggy. There's swamps, but there's a lot of lakes. So Access is largely by way of helicopter and winter ice roads, but it has to be cold enough for long enough in order to develop the ice roads. And it was very difficult this year. Hmm. Uh, another thing that I will make a note to talk about later on. Uh, sure. One point, though, the, the numbers I talked about early, earlier, by the way, um, so the IRR, CapEx and all these things, I had to go um, to, the, to the full report to, to get it. My, to get them myself. And as you said, you are not the person behind putting them out, I don't assume. But so in your current presentation, you only mentioned the pre-tax numbers. And that was kind of curious to me uh, because it's not like the post-tax numbers are bad or anything like that. So I just thought like, why is that? And like, is there something else that can be done around the tax situation because of your US listing? Is, is there another reason behind you mentioning the, um, the, 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 the pre-tax numbers in there? No, uh, it's really a choice. You can pick one or the other or both. In this case, we pick the pre-tax one. Okay. But then, okay, so it's, I mean, the, the tax is still a thing. So to get a, a better understanding of the project, you, you look at the post-tax numbers, I assume. Yes, absolutely. And again, as I indicated, the PA is, is from, my, from my perspective, really a, a sort of a go, no-go. Does this project warrant expenditure of further dollars on exploration and development? I think the simple answer is yes. If I had an NPV of fifty million and an IRR five percent, I think the decision might be maybe this project isn't ultimately economic and doesn't warrant expenditure of further further monies. But I think given those numbers, which let's face it, is PE level study and they're very high numbers, I think does does justify moving the project forward. What's your internal estimate telling you about how much of the of the current resource you'll be able to upgrade or, or keep as you move from PEA to PFS? And that's part of the drilling program. In addition to testing the extensions both on long strike and at depth, we do have to do some infill drilling to upgrade the categorization of the resources. We do have measured, indicated, and inferred, but a lot, most of it is in indicated and inferred. So obviously, that's part of the process of the drilling, which then supports the preliminary feasibility study. So as I say, it's the logical development as you move through. See what the PFS says. If it's still positive, perhaps there's more drilling. You move on to a definitive feasibility study. You do more engineering get much uh, closer on what your capital and operating costs are. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I'm asking about. What's sort of the goal or the target internally to, like what percentage of the current resource do you want to move into proven and probable? Uh, again, we're looking at, well, both Thompson Brothers and Grass River, we're looking at upgrading the classifications on. Yeah, um, at I mean, how much of the current resource do you think you, you can carry? Like, is it 80% of the MPV that you have right now that you want to carry? Is it 50%? What was your, your, your guess mm -hmm. telling you? I'd probably say 80%, yeah. Okay, yeah, fair. Uh, that's a, well, that's a goal that, 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 I mean, for me, better 
it makes it better for me to understand how you can move this forward. How much money do you think you have to spend to go from PEA to PFS with all the infill drilling and everything? Uh, you'd probably have to spend somewhere between three and five million between the drilling and the pre-feasibility study. Okay. Uh, are you still planning to have the, the pre-fees done by Q2 of 2025? Uh, that sort of depends now on next winter's weather and drill season. Hmm. Does it also depend on permits, locals, fishes? No, we birds? do have permits. Um, there's no issue with permits. There's no issue with doing further exploration drilling. It really comes down to weather and ultimately, uh, you know, funding as well. We do have uh, money in the bank, but we have another project, which I presume you want to talk about as well, the Shatford Lake project, which sure. we can do work on, which is not dependent on winter drilling. Right. Um, what about locals? Again, I, I mentioned fishes and, and, and birds because you're you're on the lakes of the Wakusco Lake, I believe. Yes. Uh, that used for fishing. And are you allowed to go there year round? Uh, talk to me about that. Yes. Uh, during the winter, uh, it's generally helicopter. During the summer, there are bush trails. There's certainly uh, boat access. So we can access the property year round. It just depends on the mode of transportation. Okay. And the locals Obviously are happy with all the with... lake. Okay. Sorry, with all the lakes, it depends on, again, whether they're frozen. So if you can take sleds across the lakes, et cetera. So sure. it's typical okay. Northern Canada terrain, if you will, be it Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories. So mm. Manitoba's kind of, I've never been, but when I think of Manitoba, I kind of imagine sort of a swampy place, if you will. Is that, I mean, is that the case? <laughs> there's a lot of lakes. There's a lot of lakes. There's a lot of bogs. There's a lot of swamps. Same with Northern Saskatchewan. Same with uh, up in the Northern uh, Northwest Territories as well. Definitely a lot of lakes. Sure. Um, the other comment I'll make on Snow Lake is we're just in the process of completing our second year of environmental baseline data collection. And this is the entire suite of environmental data that's required in order to apply for a permit. And that includes water, surface water, groundwater, wildlife, birds, um, the whole suite, if you will. So that was initiated again before I came on board May two years ago. It'll be completed end of May this year. Two years of environmental baseline data is the minimum required to apply for a permit. Um, the other thing on Snow Lake is the size of the project we feel will be under the triggers for a federal, Canadian federal government environmental impact assessment. So hopefully we will only be dealing with the Manitoba government for the environmental impact assessment. So again, two levels of reg uh, regulation in Canada. There's the federal level and the provincial level. The federal level kicks in once you have a project of a certain size. And then essentially you're hoping not to have to double your work from an end. Yes. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of work if you have both federal and provincial. There may be components where the federal government claims jurisdiction, such as um, fisheries, for example, Department of Fisheries often claims jurisdiction. But what we're hoping to do, and as I say, there are size limits for mines under the federal leg legislation. If you're under that size limit, there is no requirement to do a full-blown federal environmental impact assessment. Okay. How many First Nations are you dealing with there? There are four First Nations that we're dealing with. Okay. All of them um, commercially inclined and happy to work with you, or how does that how does that sit? Uh, there's a long history of First Nations in Canada. The good news about Snow Lake is it is a mining jurisdiction. You've got Hud Bay with the Lawler Mine that's been there for 100 years. You've got Valley with the T3 Nickel Mine up in Thompson. So it is a mining jurisdiction, or sorry, it is a mining region of Manitoba. And it basically provides the economic engine for northern Manitoba. Obviously, we have to sit and do consultation with each of the four First Nations. That's a work in progress, uh, running parallel to our environmental baseline data collection. So before you can go and do infill drilling, you'd have to have all No, no, we can proceed with that. Um, consultation is ultimately an obligation of the government, but they typically delegate it to individual companies. So we will sit with chief and council in the various communities and discuss our exploration programs. Okay. Fair. Um, that's also something I, I, I'd like an update on next time. Let's talk about sure. financing this thing, though, when you move forward. It, I mean, it, again, not a huge amount of money to get it going, uh, this 50 million bucks. 
how would you how would you you don't know yet i know but how would you prefer to finance it early days we'd have to move through as i say pre-feasibility and probably definitive feasibility study to get to get a much sharper um feel on what our operating and capital costs are the other component of lithium as you know is we'd have to discuss offtake agreements ultimately that would be one of the keys for any sort of financing structure be it equity debt streaming what have you ultimately if someone is lending us money they are going to want to be looking for security of the revenue stream and that's where the offtake comes in okay it's premature to have discussions on offtake right now we haven't developed the project hmm. far enough to have those discussions it's maybe not premature to know if those discussions are doable in the first place oh absolutely Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. We we have the most advanced project, lithium project in Manitoba, yeah. um, and it's certainly more advanced than the majority of the ones in Ontario. There's a few in Quebec, obviously, that are up. Well, the second lithium mine, Sayona's mine, came on stream last fall. So that's the second lithium mine in Canada. The Tanko mine in Manitoba has been producing lithium for the past 50 years. So uh, there's now two lithium mines in Canada, and there is a lot of activity in Quebec, obviously. Right. Do you? Uh, I asked you how you would, how you would want to finance it. But do you want to finance it in the first place, or would you prefer to sell the project before it's even gotten to that point? What's what's, what's sort of your desire? Uh, ultimately, I come from a background of companies that have actually financed, built, and operated mines. So ultimately, I'd like to see it put into operation. But again, depending on the market, depending on uh, the EV transition, you know, certainly if you look at all of the experts out there, even though their crystal balls are not perfect, certainly you know if you're looking at the uh, clean energy transition and the EV transition, and you look at lithium or you look at other commodities such as graphite that go into EVs, Anyone is predicting that demand will outstrip supply and there will not be enough supply of lithium coming on in the next one to two decades. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into geopolitical. You look at Australia, you look at South America. Obviously, Canada has the mineral resources, particularly hard rock lithium. A lot of those issues come from, from decades of underinvestment in the space and underinvestment brings other issues with it too. Uh, among which labor shortages. And that's also a point that I wanted to discuss with you. If this thing was to get into production, you'd obviously need the team. So can you sure. build a team that can build a yes. mine here? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The advantage, again, of Snow Lake is it's basically sandwiched between Hud Bay and Valley's mine. So there is an existing trained, skilled labor force and suppliers and material suppliers. So we're not central Ontario where there is no infrastructure, there is no um, local community. There is a local community up in sort of the Flin Flon, Snow Lake, Thompson region of northern Manitoba. Yes, there is a workforce. Yes, there is a skilled workforce, certainly materials, suppliers, rail connection, highway yeah. connection. So the infrastructure is there, power, water, all of that is there. Obviously, for any individual project, you'd have to bring power and water in, but certainly the infrastructure in the region is there. We're not in a isolated area where there is no infrastructure or no existing workforce, no existing operations. So that's one of the advantages of Snow Lake. Mm. You mentioned, and I opened up your link, LinkedIn profile here because you mentioned your previous experience. And I remember looking at it earlier and seeing Endeavor Mining on there. Um, what, what kind of, because you said previous experience was sort of bringing mines into production. What, what specifically were you referring to when you said that? Um, I have worked with companies that have put gold mines into production in Mexico, copper mines in production in Utah, gold mines into production in French West Africa. Okay. Is is that um oh that okay, the West Africa thing is, is the company that uh, Endeavor acquired then I assume Taranga Gold. Taranga. Yes. I was it. one of the original directors of Taranga Gold and ultimately it was acquired by Endeavor Mining. I, together with one of the other independent directors of Taranga, were appointed as the two nominees on Endeavor's board after the transaction closed. Okay. You didn't stay long in Endeavor. How come? Uh, well, you'd have to speak to Endeavor about that. But uh, essentially, they wanted to put non-Taranga gold members on the board, from what I understand. Okay. 
Fair point. Uh, you also currently have other board positions. Um, by the looks of it, what? How much of your time goes to those positions? Very little time. Uh, one is Trailbreaker Resources. It's a gold gener project generating company doing exploration in British Columbia. I'm an independent director of that. And the other one is Talon Metals, which is developing a nickel project in Minnesota. Again, independent director of both. The time is really sitting on board meetings once every month, once every quarter when uh, boards are required. Okay. Yeah. So basically, not a lot of time. So 99% of your time, you'd say 95%, something like that goes. Absolutely. Snow Lake. Yep. Snow Lake. Okay. Good. Well, will you be able to lean on to some of those connections of yours if you were to go for a strategic partner to help you drill some of these other projects that you're picking up in this also segue where we can talk a little bit about those as well? Uh, but yeah, talk to me about this. It, it, would you want a strategic investor in this company in the first place to begin with? And could you get it if you wanted it? I think the answer is simple answer is yes. Um, it's something that we're not pursuing right now. Um, again, we're a publicly listed company, like every junior exploration development company, we're dependent on the capital markets. Um, we do feel that the two materials that we're in, lithium and uranium, ultimately over the next decade, uh, there will be demand for those. You talked about underinvestment, and I think going back to uranium for a moment. Um, I think over the past decade, decade and a half, there's been severe underinvestment investment in the uranium space. Um, the number of new mines that have been brought on board, certainly in the Western world, very minimal. And even companies that are bringing mines back into production are facing production challenges. So I think you're starting to see the results of that underinvestment in the uranium space over the past 10, 20 years. Right. So just a, I know that you almost have to go here. Uh, so just before we forget to touch upon the two other projects that you picked up on, one of them is not in your presentation. So specifically the Ontario project is not right. in your current investor presentation. Is that a nod to saying we're not doing much on, on it or, or why is it not on uh, it? Yes. Uh, it's basically probably the lowest priority project we have right now. What sort of, I mean, Lowest priority doesn't mean no priority at all or, or no attention at all. But what what's your, sort of your idea for it? Like, what, why do you even have it in the first place? Because you just picked it up. Uh, it was it was an opportunity again to uh, build out our portfolio. Uh, right now, the allocation of our existing funding is on other projects, and it's is as I say, is not the uh, not the priority right now. Okay, what what then is happening this year, Chatford Lake? Because I assume something is happening there. Yeah, Shatford Lake is very intriguing. Again, it is a series of claims on the southern boundary of the Tanko lithium mine. As you know, Tanko has produced cesium, tantalum, and lithium. It's been producing lithium for the past 50 years. Um, as they say in the mining business, the best place to look for a new mine is beside an existing mine. So, But it's exploration. Uh, but it's a good geological address. It's next to a producing mine, a longstanding producing mine. So we're actually just in the process of having ground crews mobilize to site over the next couple of weeks. The snow is finally melting. So in the next, what are we, 17th of April, by the end of the month, the crews will be on the ground. Again, doing geophysics, ground geophysics, prospecting, sampling, um, essentially to set up drill targets as well. So once the ground geophysics and the sampling is completed, and we've identified it. drill targets, we will be going in and doing some initial drilling there. But it's so basically grass, grassroots exploration. Drill targets by Q4 2024? Uh, hopefully before then. Hopefully okay. before then. We hope to be drilling. Uh, are we now going to Q2, Q3? Hope to be drilling by Q3. Oh, okay. Well, you said the budget was not done for this year. Uh, I'm still going to try again to push a little bit on it because I just want what what percentage of the money do you want to spend on uh, Shatford Lake versus the the uranium package? Uh, I would have to go back and calculate a percentage, but we will be spending a reasonable amount on Shatford Lake. Uh, exploration in Canada is a little more expensive than it is in Namibia. Exploration in Namibia is relatively cost-effective. We can get a lot done for less than comparable work in Canada. 
So we're probably spending much more on Chatford Lake than we will in Namibia to essentially do similar programs. Hmm. You don't have any drill contracts, I don't assume, because you don't know where the targets are or how much you want to drill either. We have drillers lined up, um, ready to go, but first we need to identify the targets and figure out what our uh, meter is going to be. Then we'll uh, continue those conversations. But there are drillers available, and we have been in contact with them. Just a matter of coming up with the appropriate drill targets. Okay. But you don't know how much money they're going to ask for per meter drilled? Nope. Not yet. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just basically where I'm going from going to with this is trying to figure out whether you're going to have to raise money in 2024 and how much of an impact that might have if you have to do it. Uh, certainly, we, we're always looking at the potential to raise money. Um, we certainly see that the capital markets are generally favorable to uranium right now. Um, even though lithium prices are starting to bounce off the bottom, we think we've hit the bottom there. So there is some uh, interest coming back into the lithium space as well. So as a junior non-revenue generating company, we're always op- you know, opportunistic, if you will, if a market window opens to raise additional funding. Mm-hmm. So certainly something we're constantly looking at. Good. Well, again, Frank, as as it became evident from this uh, discussion here, we're going to have to do a follow-up conversation. Hopefully sure. you have your picture up on the website by then too, by the way, because that's not up on there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're in the process of redoing the website. So apologies, it's it's uh, it's a little out of date, but uh, we're focusing on getting our programs and boys and girls into the field right now. And then I'll turn back to the uh, to the website. 